Good morning, everyone. A, a few minutes behind, I uh, am going back on my own promise of starting at 8.30 a.m. sharp, but welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, you are here on the first day of strengthening accessibility and inclusion within professional programs running from today through till June 17th. This is day one, and this conference is being hosted by the University of Toronto Accessibility Offices. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so I will start by introducing myself. Uh, my name is Natalie Roach. I'm an assistant director for accessibility services at the St. George campus. Um, I am a multiracial woman uh, in my late 30s and I have long black curly hair and I am wearing brown glasses and a white shirt. Uh, my background on Zoom is blurred. And so I wanted to start with an access check. So we understand access to be a shared responsibility between everyone in this space. We will strive to create an accessible space that reduces the need for you to disclose a disability or impairment for the purposes of gaining an accommodation. In doing this together, we strive to welcome disability and the changes it brings into our space. Is there anything about the virtual space that we should address now? Are there any other access needs that might affect your participation in the workshop that we could also address? On the next slide, we will go over how you can submit a response to either of these two questions, as well as for the rest of the conference. Next slide, please. Throughout the conference, all speakers will describe visual elements, including themselves, as best they can. We welcome participants to turn off their camera, get up, move around, and take as many screen breaks as they need to throughout the conference. This slide shows a visual of the Zoom control at the bottom of your screen. Use the Q&A to submit questions for the presenters or if you experience any technical difficulties and require assistance. You are able to submit questions anonymously. If you prefer to ask your question live, you can use the raise hand feature and you will be asked to unmute yourself. Keyboard users press Option and then Y on a Mac or Alt and Y on Windows. Mouse users select Participants, choose Raise Hands at the bottom of the panel. We respectfully request that you wait until the designated question period to ask questions using either the Q&A or Raise Hand feature. Note that moderators may not be able to get to all questions. We are real-time captioning the entire conference. To enable text captioning, click on Live's transcript and select Show Subtitles. Text captioning is auto-enabled on mobile devices. We also have sign language interpreting for the entire conference, which is available on laptop and desktop computers. Please submit a question via the Q&A feature if you are experiencing any difficulties. Next slide, please. So I'll go over the agenda for day one, Wednesday, June 15th. Uh, we are currently doing our greeting and access check. We'll then have a, um, I will just acknowledge right now, I did not update this slide. <laughs> we are then going to have um, an Indigenous opening uh, by, uh, Vern Ross, uh, who's joining us, and he is a traditional knowledge keeper. My apologies for that. Uh, then we're going to have an introduction to Dr. Ferrani Okunlami by Dr. Pearl Levy, and then we'll have our keynote address by Dr. Ferrani Okunlami. Then we will have a break, and then from 10.15 till 11.30 a.m., we will have Navigating Intersecting Identities, a student panel discussion on navigating professional programs and practice as a BIPOC student with a lived experience of disability. Next slide, please. We'll then have uh, probably a much needed lunch break to uh, refresh our minds and uh, eyes from 11.30 till 12.30. And from 12.30 to 1.45, we will have accommodation, academic remediation, learning skills, and stepping out and back into academic programs. From 1.45 until 2 p.m., we will have a break. And then the day will conclude with 
uh, Critical Cases in Professional Faculty Accommodations, a review with Sari Springer, and that will be from 2 p.m. until 3 p.m. Next slide, please. It is my pleasure to introduce Vern Ross, who will be providing us with an opening. Vern Ross is from Cote First Nation, a Salto nation belonging to Treaty 4 in Saskatchewan. He has always worked with traditional healers and language interpreters. Vern is not an elder, however, he works with elders guidance and is one of the traditional knowledge keepers. Vern holds a BA in Indigenous Studies and a Master of Social Work. Currently in a PhD, his research focus is Two-Spirited People. He has also taught several courses at the Center for Indigenous Studies Department at U of T. Vern continues to be a social worker, teacher, and mentor for students from all walks of life. It's my pleasure to introduce Vern Ross. Hi, Natalie. I think we're just still waiting for Vern. Okay. All right. Let me just. Hi, Vern. This is uh, tech support. I've promoted you up to panelists. You'll just need to select the prompt that's on your screen to agree, and then you'll be able to move on over here. Great, Vern. I'm seeing that you're joining on the panelist side. You'll just need to turn your camera on and unmute yourself, and then uh, we can. Oh, wonderful. Are you able to hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, wonderful. Okay, I just want to say, Chimi Guich, thank you for inviting me to this wonderful gathering here. And I also want to um, acknowledge our wonderful students. And also I want to acknowledge all of our grandmothers and our grandfathers who give us so much in life. And each of those grandmothers and those grandfathers sit in those four directions. And we are reminded by our grandmothers and our grandfathers to be good to the people and to be good to, to Mother Earth. But I also want to, uh, to give a, also a, uh, a huge hanin and a tanse and a tanshe, a sego, a kwe. And once again, I'd like to introduce myself, not just in my English name, but also in my Nishnabe name which is Minu Gijigad Ginewaji Binishi. That means nice day, nice bird. And I am pleased and honored to extend my greetings to everyone that has been has, uh, is joining us here today, this morning. But allow me to say a few words um, on the what we call our precious land. And to begin for all of us to feel the land that we called Mother Earth. We're given that responsibility to take care of the land and all the plants and all on Mother Earth. Before I give the, the land acknowledgement, I'm going to uh, light up uh, our uh, the the sacred um, me uh, medicines, and which is the the sage to send us off in a good way and and in a healthy way, but also to work with um, good minds here.
sage is one of our sacred form medicines, followed by tobacco, cedar, and sweetgrass wingush. I like the smudge bowl as a way to send us off in a very positive way to give us that strength. As we are about to share with each other, we are about to share our stories with each other. And I just wanted to um, express and to stress the importance of us, let's give us the recognition to, to our voices and our stories so that we can become the story ourselves. Stories can be a big part of our lives. We are reminded that our voices and stories create a positive enriching learning space for our students, but don't let's not forget about our families, our teachers, our youth, including our grandmothers and our grandfathers, and even our social workers, or even our doctors, but also for those little ones as well. Let us not forget our voices that give us our stories, which are part of healing. Listen to each other, be kind to each other, and most important, to help each other out, as we are all teachers here. Learn from each other, keep on strengthening each other, especially for our students. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the land that we are on, the sacred land on which the University of Toronto operates. It has been the site of human activity for over 15,000 years. The land is the territory of the Huron, Wendat, and the Patoon First Nation, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. The territory was the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Iroquois Confederacy and the Confederacy of the Ojibwe and the Allied Nations to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. Today, the meeting place of Toronto is still the home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island. And we are grateful to have the opportunity to work in the community and on this territory. So with thing I have said that once again, I, ex I extend my greetings and my welcoming to everyone that's here. I like to consider this as our community and that we continue to work with inclusion, not exclusion. And to acknowledge those ones that are walking into our offices, into our own communities, welcome them because it's not easy. Many of us are, are have a hard time to ask for help. And sometimes just taking that, just to acknowledge that person that, they, that needs help really means a lot. I personally went through that myself, so I know what it's like. Is one of the reasons why I became a social worker myself. And getting my teachings from the elders who teach me and, and show me and remind me to be myself and know where I come from. Respect those languages. Learn your language. Even if you don't know much of your language, at least take that initiative to learn your language. And when I see those little children speaking their own language, it just, it just lightens up my heart because I know they're learning. I never had that opportunity in doing that when I was growing up. And that was because of the residential school era, but that doesn't stop me from learning. I also want to give thanks for the organizers that organize this beautiful gathering. And I'm honored to be part of it. So with you have said that, I just want to say for all of us, that for everyone here, is that I want you to all repeat after me. And it's the way of showing our appreciation. I want to say, Chimigwech, 
Chimigwech, Chimigwech, Chimigwech. That means thank you. And I'm giving all the thank yous in all those four directions. So I just want to say all, once again, is to keep on learning and strengthening each other, and especially for the students. You all have a wonderful day. Give me wake. Thanks, Natalie. Thank you, Vern. So hi, everyone. We, we've got um, a, a few extra moments here um, before we are going to uh, move over to Dr. Pearl Levy, who is going to introduce our keynote speaker. Um, there, there may be some challenges with uh, Dr. Okunlami joining this morning, so uh, if we are a bit delayed in uh, seeing him, we will uh, just, just have a little bit of a break before, uh, before our next session. Uh, but uh, maybe we could move on with that introduction, and I'll just say, Pearl, would you be ready to, to do that introduction for Dr. Okunlami? Yeah. Great. I'm Pearl Levy. I'm accommodation specialist for practicums, placements, and laboratories at the University of Toronto. I'm a middle-aged Caucasian woman with brown curly hair, and I'm wearing a gray shirt. It's a great honor to welcome Dr. Akunlami here today. I've heard him present before, and I know that you can anticipate a dynamic and thought-provoking talk. I'm convinced that his words and ideas will stay with you long after this presentation is over. Dr. Aluwa Ferrami Okunlami is a Director of Student Accessibility and Accommodation Services at the University of Michigan, where he oversees the Office of Services for Students with Disabilities, two testing accommodation centers, and the Adaptive Sports and Fitness Program. He is also an assistant professor of family medicine, physical medicine and rehabilitation and urology, at Michigan Medicine, and an adjunct assistant professor of orthopedic surgery at David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. Dr. O was born in Nigeria before immigrating to the US as a young age. He attended high school at Deerfield Academy and college at Stanford University, where he also ran track and field serving as captain in these last two seasons and achieving academic All-American recognition. He then earned his MD from the University of Michigan before matching into orthopedic surgery at Yale. At the beginning of his third year, he experienced a spinal cord injury, paralyzing him from the chest down. After two surgeries and intense rehabilitation, he was blessed with some return of motor function and he navigates the world as a proud wheelchair user, managing the other long-term sequela of an incomplete cervical spine cord injury. He went on to earn a master's in engineering science and technology entrepreneurship from the University of Notre Dame and completed his family medicine residency at Memorial Hospital in South Bend, Indiana. He served in the St. Joseph County Board of Health, appointed by then mayor, now current secretary, of the Department of Transportation, Pete Buttigieg, and is on the board of the River City Challenged Athletes, a nonprofit supporting the area adaptive sports teams. He was featured on Robin Roberts' Good Morning America series, Thriver Thursday, and is a catchphrase, disabusing disability, hoping to demonstrate that disability doesn't mean inability. He is a member of the Alpha Omega Alpha Medical Honor Society, received Michigan Medicine's Distinguished Early Career Alumni Award in 2020, and he was given the Teacher's Teacher Award by the Academy of Medical Educators. Nationally, he serves as a disability issues representative on the steering committee for the Group on Diversity and Inclusion at the Association of American Medical Colleges sits on the National Medical Association's Council on Medical, Le Medical Legislation, 
and was invited by the White House Office of Public Engagement to participate in the Health Equity Leaders Roundtable series dedicated to exploring perspectives around access to care. He was appointed to the American 250 Foundation Health and Wellness Advisory Council and speaks around the country on topics related to diversity, equity, and inclusion, including, but not limited to creating a health system that is accessible to and inclusive of both patients and providers with disabilities and providing reasonable and appropriate accommodations for students with disabilities in higher education. He has been featured on CBS News, PBS NewsHour, and MSNBC's Morning Joe and is passionate about adaptive sports and fitness, striving to provide access to physical fitness and inclusive recreational and competitive sports for all. Good morning, everyone. I hope you are doing well. Thank you so much for having me. My name is Fermi Okunlami. I go by Dr. O. I use he, him, his pronouns. I am a middle-aged black man with brown skin. I've got short black hair and wearing dark rimmed glasses, a wooden bow tie, collared shirt, and a dark vest. In my background, you can see some fake trees because I can't keep real ones alive, a flag from the president, and then it's to my office. I am delighted to be here with you today and looking forward to then sharing with you. Now, I tell people that if you have any questions, please feel free throughout the presentation to then, to then put them in the chat. I tell people that I don't like giving talks. Now, anyone that knows me says that that's a lie because I love to talk. Now, it's not that I don't like talking. I said I don't like giving talks. What I like to do is start conversations. So what I truly hope today will be is a conversation and that my voice is not the only voice that we hear. Because if that is what we do, then I feel as though I've done all of you a disservice. And so the goal today will be not for me to be the first or the best or the only to have these conversations with you, but merely to then start these conversations about accessibility and inclusion with respect to the things that we do. So I'm going to share my screen here for a moment. Can someone give me a thumbs up and let me know that you are seeing everything that we have on the screen, either in the chat? Or That's not. a thumbs up. Thank you very much. Now, as you see here, I titled my presentation, Disabusing Disability, hoping to, hoping to demonstrate that disability doesn't mean inability. Now, I will go through a series of slides that I tell you are a mere suggestion, because if there are things that come up in the course of this presentation that you want to then focus on, then that is the direction we will go in. I know that there's, uh, I've been given the list of the different groups of individuals that are on this call, and it spans the gamut from multiple different institutions and universities with different faculty, staff, students, and people from all different fields. And so therefore, I know that there is a diverse set of perspectives that are in the audience today. And therefore, please, by all means, feel free to then put something in the chat for us to then engage in this conversation. So to begin, I always start my presentations with this slide here. Now, this slide here is a, an image with two different sides. On each side, there are three individuals that are trying to watch what appears to be a baseball game on the other side of a fence. I call these people tall, medium, and short, which represents how tall they are. On the left side of the image, tall, medium, and short individuals are each standing on one wooden box. With that one wooden box, the tall individual can see over the fence and see the game. The medium individual can see over the fence and see the game, but the short individual cannot see over the fence or through the fence and see the game. Under this side, it says the word equality. Now, the other half of this image, it has those same three individuals, but now the boxes have been redistributed in a way such that the tall individual is no longer standing on a box and can still see the game. The medium individual is still standing on one box and can see the game. And now the short individual is standing on two boxes and can now see the game. Under this side, it says the word equity. Now, I encourage you that if anyone has seen this slide before, please put it in the chat. Even if I may not be able to respond to all of them, just tell me what it is that you have seen this slide used to do, what has been the situation in which the slide has been described, as I will just continue talking. 
But what people have seen this slide used for is usually in diversity, equity, and inclusion presentations, in staff team building presentations. And what people say is that this slide is hoping to demonstrate that equity and equality are not the same thing. People say that equality is giving everyone the same thing, whereas equity is giving people what they need to have access or sometimes what they need to then be successful. Now, I say to people that it's unfortunate because early times when I've shown this slide, sometimes people feel very comfortable and they talk to me about the slide. Other times people then put comments in the chat or online after the presentation is done. And unfortunately, one day an individual put in the chat why don't those insert racial slur here, buy tickets like everyone else, and watch the game from the inside? I will say that again. One time someone saw this slide and said, why don't those insert racial slur here, buy tickets like everyone else, and watch the game from the inside? I say that not to be jarring or controversial, but I say it because we don't often recognize that when we see an image, Two people looking at the same image may see two very different things. Oftentimes when people have conversations about diversity, equity, inclusion, accessibility, justice, we think that we're all on the same page. We think that we identify the same problem and are hoping to then find a solution to the problem that we see. But what we don't recognize is that sometimes people see a very different problem. And when we look at a slide and we are talking about access and equality, other people look at it and they see someone trying to take something that doesn't belong to them. Now, once again, the reason why I bring this up is not to be controversial, but it's because we have to recognize it in the conversations that we have. If we don't know what someone sees when they see an image, if we don't know what they identify as the problem, as we are trying to work together towards a solution, we will not come to a solution that is actually rectifying the problem that we want to fix. Now, this doesn't mean that every single person's view of what this is should be seen as equal. Because I do feel as though there are certain things that are wrong. There are certain things that we can stand behind and say this is something that we should strive for. But at the same time, if we don't have conversations with people on other sides of the fence, we fail to then have the opportunity to then come to a, an agreement or come to an understanding as to what it is we're trying to fix. Now, when having these conversations, it's much easier to talk about cartoons, especially when the reality looks more like this. And this slide has added a third image to that same image. On this one now, the tall individual is standing on seven or eight boxes well above the field and can clearly see down on the game. The medium individual is still standing on their one box, but now that short individual is standing in a box-sized hole. Now, what happens when we have these conversations is that it's easy to talk about access, inclusion, resources with this cartoon, because when we talk about how access and how resources are allocated in the real life, it becomes more contentious. But in this image, people even get to the point of saying, well, why did that tall individual have to give their box up for the short individual? When people look at the boxes in the first image that I see, they see those boxes, those resources as belonging to that individual, and that that individual has the right to their own box, and it is not their responsibility to then provide access for someone else. When we look at this third image now, we talk about the resources, and we see that there are some that have more resources than they actually need, and there are others that are starting from a resource-poor standpoint. But what often comes up is that someone says, well, I worked very hard for all of these boxes. And so why should I be the one giving up my boxes for someone else? I don't know what that short individual did to dig themselves into that box sized hole. And so therefore, why should I have to give my boxes up for that short individual? Now, this is where I raise my hand and I say that each and every one of us has certain positions of privilege and has likely been subject to certain prejudices. I recognize that being born a man, I had certain privileges than others. Being born without a disability, I have certain privileges than others. But I also recognize that being born with my black skin is something that has been made me subject to certain prejudices as well. And therefore, there are certain boxes 
that I was given that I did not necessarily deserve, that I did not do anything to earn, but were there before I even came around. Yet there were some people that had already dug a hole for me that put me behind in a place where even before I had any say, I was in a hole that needed to be supported. Now that is where each and every one of us has intersecting identities and the resources that we may need to have access may not always be the same and may not be based on anything that we did or didn't do to deserve them. Now, the reason that I lead with these is because to then have the conversation we're having today, I sort of wrap it up with this image. This image now is another take on that same idea. And with this one, there are two halves of the screen once again. Once again, three people on either side of the screen, each trying to watch what appears to be a game on a field on the other side of the fence. But in this one now, I think this does what I think is trying to then reflect more diverse perspectives. What I didn't say to you in that first image was that that first image was all individuals with the same skin tone, though the, the, the comment that someone made would have then indicated that. In this image now, people have different complexions, which I hope is trying to demonstrate different race. It also has individuals with different clothing and different hairstyles, which is, in my opinion, an attempt to then reflect different gender. It also has an individual that's a wheelchair user, which is then hoping to then reflect our disabled community. And I will say that even after months of using the slide, it wasn't until a few months ago that I noticed the rainbow on the top right corner of one part of the slide, which I think is hoping to then identify with the LGBTQ community. Now, the reason that I use this slide as I launch into these conversations is because the first few images were not accurate reflections of everyone. Now, I cannot say that this image is an accurate reflection of everyone, but at the very least, it then shows that there are people that were not included in the first images. And as we're having conversations about access, about equity, about equality, there would be people who would not be served if we had the conversation looking at those factors alone. And so I think this then leads us to a conversation that is more relevant to the accessibility discussions we have today. Because I say that as an individual who identifies as disabled, as a wheelchair user myself, if you gave me those boxes, that would not have then given me the access to be able to then see that game. But if you took the wood that was needed to make a box and instead you built a ramp, then that would give me the access that I needed. Now, depending on how sort of controversial people want to be, they will look at this image and they'll say, Dr. O, oh, the amount of wood that it takes to make one or two boxes seems like it is much less wood than it is taken to then build that ramp. And I say, you know what? Sometimes it does take more resource to provide access for the disability community. But is that the reason that you are not going to provide them with access? Are you going to say that because it takes a little bit more, now this group does not deserve to have access to these same things that the non-disabled individual has access to? So that is where I then lead into these conversations about accessibility. Because in the world in which we are in, there are plenty of individuals who deserve to have access but who are not given that access. And so what I do is then I, I go back to talking about my own life. Once again, not because I am the first or the best or the only, but because I did not even realize how inaccessible our world was until a few years ago. So I show this image here, which is a, a little collage of my life. The first image is me jumping through the air when I was an All-American track athlete at Stanford University. I then have an image of me jumping in the air once again as I graduated from medical school at the University of Michigan. And I have an image of my family, physicians, lawyers, doctors, PhDs. Now this is not to give myself a pat on the back, but it's just meant to then show what my life was up to one point. I was born in Nigeria to two physician parents. We then immigrated to this country where my parents then had to redo their residency trainings because the United States did not recognize the education that they'd received in Nigeria. So they both did their pediatrics residency at Howard University. And then my mother went on to do pediatric critical care at Johns Hopkins. And my father did neonatal critical care fellowship at Georgetown. We then moved to Indiana where I went to private school before going out east again to Massachusetts for boarding school at Deerfield Academy. 
while at Deerfield Academy, I, I like to think that I got involved in many things. I sang, I danced, I acted, I played different sports. I was leader of the class, leader of groups. Now, this was just to show that diversity was part of my world. Diversity was not something that was a buzzword or a checkbox that we felt as though we were trying to accomplish. It was just a mere fact that my parents had then provided us with access to a diverse set of opportunities. The individuals within the communities in which we lived were diverse from different countries, different continents, different walks of life, different socioeconomic backgrounds, different ethnicities, different races, different religions. And so I saw this melting pot of individuals just as the way the world was. I then ended up going, as I said, out west to Stanford University, where I continued playing sports, continued leading groups, and then ended up going directly to medical school at the University of Michigan. And then, as I said, matched into orthopedic surgery residency at Yale. Now, up until that point, all of these sort of academic and athletic pursuits were the way that I judged myself. It was how I felt as though I brought value to the world. And it was how other people saw the value that I thought that I was contributing. Now, it was not until then this happened where I then dove into a pool and broke my neck, becoming paralyzed from my chest down with very minimal use of my upper extremities. At that point, my life changed in a, in a way that people felt that it changed the trajectory of what opportunities I was going to have. Now, I had two surgeries at Yale before then being transported to the Midwest where I went to what was then called the Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago, which is now the Shirley Ryan Abilities Lab. And that's where I did my acute inpatient rehabilitation. At that time, I was introduced to adaptive sports, which are considered sports for individuals with disabilities. I like to think of it as sports for individuals that, for, for of all abilities, so adaptive sports are sports that allow everyone to participate together. I also started to experience some return of motor function. And I am looking in the chat here. So I actually, some people are using the Q&A as well. And I'm going to pause because I know that Natalie is speaking, but I do want to then make sure that if, as I invited people in, I do want people to then be able to chat. So we have a question that says, how do we work to remove the barriers that prevent access? I don't think giving access removes barriers. Now that's, that's a wonderful question. So I'll say that, as I'll, I'll jump ahead here, because one of the roles that I play now is I'm the Director of Student Accessibility and Accommodation Services at the University of Michigan, which means that I oversee our Office of Services for Students with Disabilities, our two testing accommodation centers, and our adaptive sports and fitness program. I'm also an Assistant Professor of Family Medicine, Physical Medicine, and Rehabilitation and Neurology at Michigan Medicine, and an Assistant Professor of Orthopedic Surgery at David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. So in terms of removing barriers versus providing access, you know, I'll give a, a real example. So here at the University of Michigan, well, we have a very, very old institution. And so therefore we have many buildings that are not necessarily accessible at this point. And so the goal that our office has is providing equitable access for students with disabilities. And so there are times where there may be a class in a building that on the basis of you know, the age of this institution, the building is not physically accessible for some reason. Now, of course, my goal would be that every building on this campus is physically accessible, and therefore we should be able to then allow any student to be able to then get access to a class in any building. Now, that is unfortunately not always going to be something that is feasible, and so therefore, if there's a student that has a class in a certain place that is not accessible, there are ways that we can provide that student with access to that course and that curriculum, but it may not necessarily remove the barrier that exists. That barrier is the fact that that building is not accessible. That building is something that needs to change. And sometimes providing that access means that that class section gets moved to another building, right? There are times where the access being provided is actually building a ramp or putting in a lift or doing something that would essentially remove a barrier or address a barrier. But there are times that getting that access for a student is actually finding a different way to then achieve the same goal. Now it's because removing those barriers does take time. And it doesn't mean that we don't also attempt to then remove barriers, but it means that in order to then give people the access that they need, it's sometimes more timely 
to then figure out what ways we can accommodate the situation to still provide the student with access while then hoping to address the barrier at a later date. Now, what I will say is that does that mean that all buildings get addressed right away? Unfortunately not, because I think too often what happens is we move that class section or we, we put it somewhere else so that the student can have access to that curriculum, that education that they need. And then that building goes on a list of things that need to be addressed because that's something that we can then get to at a separate point, but it does not always change the fact that that barrier is still there. So it is a very important question. And I think that these are two things that we need to strive to do simultaneously is identify the barriers that exist and work to remove them while also then strive and then provide people with access, even if the barrier that exists has not changed. Now, I think that the larger conversation around this is a systemic one, because I think at times the barrier that exists, oh, this is perfect. So this individual put a question that was as if they were reading my mind. So someone said that barriers also include systemic obstacles, attitudes, and will to change policies. And access cannot be achieved without addressing those obstacles or barriers. That is exactly what I was just going to say by saying that the true barrier is the systemic belief that some individuals do not deserve access. And that is what I was leading into by using those slides in the beginning, because oftentimes we use those slides, people have different conversations about who deserves access and who does not. You know, I showed those images and there was one time where a softball player raised their hand and the softball player said, you know, the fence is not actually there to keep things out. We have the fence there to keep things in. When I grew up, there was a busy road on the other side of our softball field. And if we hit that ball out there and it crossed the road, we'd be putting ourselves in harm's way to get the ball. Additionally, hitting a home run is part of the sport that we play that we love. And if we do not have some sort of barrier or marker that indicates a home run, we then can't enjoy the game. But we would love to have people watching our games and we didn't realize that there were people on the other side of the fence that were trying to then get access. Had we known that people wanted to watch the game, we'd be able to talk to them and say, how can we include you? And we could put a chain link fence, we could put a plexiglass wall, we could do something to identify the fact that there are people inside the field that need something there for a reason, but there are people outside the fence that for whatever reason, that thing is representing a barrier to their access. But what we will find out is that oftentimes, people do not want others to then have that access. I will tell you that after experiencing my spinal cord injury, having a disability, I was eventually able to then return to medicine, but people have said to me to my face, well, Dr. Okunmami, with all due respect, you know, I know you have a son as well, and I'm sure that you would just want your son to have the best position possible. And I can't, I don't, I have a hard time reconciling with how a physician that cannot take care of themselves will be able to adequately take care of my child. And so people have told me that they do not want to have a disabled physician that they feel as though that individual is lacking in something that would be able to then be the best for their child. Now that goes back to this belief that disability means inability. People think that if one is not able to do something, that means that they're not able to do many things. And rather than allowing people to then demonstrate what it is they can do, instead of providing people with the access that they deserve to show what they can do, assumptions are made about what disability means. Now, throughout this presentation, you will see a focus on physical disability, but that is not to say that physical or apparent disabilities are the only disabilities that exist. In fact, in a lot of the work that we do in STEM, it is not the physical disability that becomes the significant sort of contentious point. It is individuals that have non-apparent disabilities that also deserve access, that sometimes makes it more difficult for people to discuss what access we should be giving people. So to get back to what I was saying in this slide here is that as I then entered the world, as I called it from the other side of the stethoscope, this was the first time I began to then see how I had been unintentionally complicit to a world of ableism. Now, I'm assuming that most people on this Zoom will understand ableism, but I will still give a description of it. You know, and then this image that I'm showing you here, it's, it's actually an image after I had then broken my neck and I'm sitting in a hospital bed with a collar around my neck. 
after my first surgery. Now, ableism, I juxtapose to racism. Racism is a systemic construct that still exists whether people choose to acknowledge it or not. Racism is the foundation upon which much of the rules and the laws and the beliefs in our country were founded upon. And racism is something that is still alive and well today that has impacts and implications on the things that we see and do. Similarly, ableism is juxtaposed to that in a way that ableism is the belief that a non-disabled body mind is the standard. Ableism is the belief that one needs to strive for this standard to be able to have access, and there are policies and procedures and laws and rules that then support this as its foundation. It's the fact that this country, this world, was not built for disabled minds in mind. And so as we then look around us, as I then entered this world, as I said, on the other side of the stethoscope, I started to see how inaccessible our world was. And despite feeling as if my academic pedigree and the degrees that I had and the work that I did should have given me access, that is when I started to then see how some people feel as though the access does not deserve, not everyone deserves to have access to those same things. And I tell people that I have been a black man my entire life, but it wasn't until eight years ago that I experienced my life with a disability that I felt as discriminated against as I have felt. Now, this does not mean that I have not experienced prejudice and discrimination as a black man. I absolutely have. But I'm saying that people have been able to do so in an even more egregious way after experiencing my disability. And so that is what has led to my desire to then make sure that we are doing everything that we can to provide equitable access to the same things that our non-disabled counterparts have. So there is an individual that raised their hand, and I will pause and allow that person to then ask their question audibly. So I believe there is an Alicia that raised their hand. So if Alicia wants to then unmute and then ask her question, please go ahead. Thank you for the opportunity. I actually uh, pressed raise hand by accident. Sorry about oh, that. No, no, no worries. A great presentation so far. Oh, well, thank you. Well, hopefully now anyone else that that wants to raise your hand. Um, Natalie is doing an excellent job of watching the hand raises. I am looking at the Q&A in the chat. And so if you have anything that you want to put in the Q&A or the chat, please feel free to do so. And I will try to then make this as interactive as possible in this Zoom world. And really I do, I do encourage you to do so because it's difficult when you, know, you can't see faces, you don't have sort of conversation to know if people are resonating with the conversation or not. And so I do want to then make sure that if there are any things that you all want to hear, any questions that you have that are not being addressed as I present, that you feel free to then chime in. So hopefully that you can see that the Q&A in the chat will be addressed. And so please feel free to then chime in if you have any interest in doing so. So I, I go back to, to this image of where we were and talking about sort of some of the systemic constructs that then have led to the racism and ableism that we see. And I was telling you that I started to then experience this world on the other side of the stethoscope and seeing how inaccessible the world was and then wanted to then make sure that I could do my part to try to then increase that access for all. Because, you know, the first example of it for me was after then being introduced to this thing, as I called adaptive sports, right? I had been an academic All-American athlete. I played basketball, soccer, lacrosse, track throughout my life. And I was introduced to these sports while I was in rehab at the Rehabilitation Institute Chicago and saw that as an All-American athlete in a Division I institution, I was given access to certain things. And I then saw that individuals living with disability did not have that same access. So adaptive sports exist, but adaptive sports are not supported in the same way as sports for those that are of able body or that are non-disabled. And so then when I went back to, to, to Indiana, after I completed my inpatient rehabilitation, I got a master's degree at Notre Dame in engineering science and technology entrepreneurship. And I used that master's degree to work on providing access to individuals living with disability by using sort of technology and innovation to then create solutions. But what also happened was then I, I started working with the St. Joseph County Board of Health, and I started recognizing the fact that there were many, many, many of our systems and structures that were not accessible. 
I also was then involved in the St. Joseph County uh, River City Rollers, which was our adaptive sports program there. And I started playing wheelchair basketball and I started playing sled hockey and started trying to then provide that access in different ways. I also finished a family medicine residency, which allowed me to then get back into the healthcare system. And I'll actually show this slide here as an example of some of the accommodations that were provided to me that then allowed me to then get to that space. So in this image, there are two sides of this with two pictures once again, and in both of them, I'm in a standing frame wheelchair. So this is a black manual frame chair that then has a hydraulic function that allowed me to then be upright. On the left side, I am in the OB units looking at a microscope and, and diagnosing rupture of membranes by looking at a slide in the triage area. And then in the other image, I'm fully sort of gowned and gloved as I'm about to then do what's called a cardiac catheterization, where I'm going to then access an individual's radial artery in their wrist to then put a wire through their, through their vessel to get into their heart, then take a look at their heart vessels. Now, I use these two images as examples because in that earlier example or statement I told you about someone saying that they don't want a doctor that is not even able to take care of themselves, this standing frame chair was one of the pieces of sort of accommodation or resources that then allowed me to feel as though I was able to then return to the life of medicine that I had before. Now, during this progress, I, I felt as though this chair really did open doors, and it did open doors for me. This chair allowed me to then be upright at the operating table and allowed me to then deliver babies and then stand up with the chair and place the baby on mom's belly. And I felt as though it opened new doors and gave me access. But what really was happening in this situation is that someone in this program did what I call assumed competence. Rather than judging or limiting me based on what they thought I could not do, they allowed me to then work with them to demonstrate what it was that I could. So now we'll take another pause and I will take a verbal question from Dana. So Dana, if you could please unmute and then ask your question. So for Franco's team, that's Dana Sahayan is the raised hand. Perfect, perfect. Sorry about that. I didn't mean to unmute or I didn't mean to raise my hand. Oh, no, oh, well, is, well, is, well, so we have another, we have another, I think there's a Sekafor, there's another raised hand by Sekafor, maybe this is a trifecta as another unintentional hand raise, but we'll see. No, no, this one, <laughs> so thank you, doctor, I'm Sefako. Uh I'm just curious about your chair, I also use wheelchair, um, and, um, I really want to have something like it. Was it expensive? Was it model for you? Like, how did you get it? So that is my question. So Thank first, you. Sakafo, where are you from? I'm from Ghana, but I am a professor in the University of the Montier. So, okay. so you're, um, my, you're my next door neighbor as a Nigerian. That's why I, I know, right? <laughs> Thank so, you. As, absolutely. So this chair, and this is part. This is part of the difficulty in terms of access, right? Is that some of the the, the resources that people then use are prohibitively expensive and then make it such that, you know, just like the individual mentioned earlier, that it, it's still not removing the barrier because this piece of equipment is access, but there's still a barrier to receiving this because most insurance companies will not cover these chairs. And it's something that I was blessed to be able to get um, through access to vocational rehabilitation and vocational rehabilitation worked with me. So that's a, in the States, there's a, a, a state, it's a state and federal level entity that then assists with providing the access that you need to then get back to work or school. And so this particular chair, every one of these wheelchairs is designed for you as an individual. It's sort of, it's measured to your specifications. But interestingly, what I was going to say about this chair is that while it's what I thought gave me the access as the return to work, it was actually until I met someone by the name of Judy Human. And so if you do not know Judy Human, the way I describe Judy Human is that Judy Human is to the disability rights movement as Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King are to black civil rights in the United States. So Judy Human is someone that if you can look her up, she has been instrumental in getting the sort of the laws and the policies passed to then provide access to individuals in this country. 
And I was showing Judy a movie that is being made about me. And in that movie, you know, I showed my sort of return to, to being able to be ambulatory and walking. And it was a, a the story of my injury and recovery. And many people see it and they think, oh, so inspirational. This is such an amazing story. But Judy saw it. And Judy said, you know what, Dr. O, if I didn't know you before seeing this, this trailer, I don't think that I would have wanted to. I said, whoa, Judy, why, why would you say that? She said, well, because there's so much focus on your being upright and walking. And what message are you then giving to those of us who are not able to walk, never had the ability to walk, or have not regained the ability to walk? This is what I meant when I say that I did not realize how I was being complicit to this system of ableism, because I had what I now call my own internalized ableism, which made me feel like I had to then get back to being upright and walking to be able to make the same impact. So while this chair has been one way to get access, I do not want to then perpetuate the belief that if one is not able to be upright, they are not able to then be as successful or as impactful. And so the chair, one could talk about, I'll let you chat in a second, the chair, you could talk about some of the sort of the physiologic benefits of, you know, you know, pressure relief off your bottom. You could talk about some of the psychosocial benefits of being face to face with someone and having a conversation, sort of looking at them in their eyes. But I think that this goes back to the systemic belief that we need to then make sure that people themselves are not seen as the problem. Whereas it's really our infrastructure and our institutions that need to shift and be more accessible to the individual, not the individual having to then shift or change themselves to then meet an inaccessible system. And so there are plenty of people that operate from a seated position. There are plenty of ways that we can then accommodate such that if there's something that needs to be done, we can make it something that can be done from a seated level as well. And so I was going to use this slide to say, initially I thought that this was what was needed. And while I still use my standing frame chair, and will be honest to say that I, I like my standing frame chair. What I also want to be very, very, very careful of doing is not to say that this chair is the reason that I'm able to then be successful again. It is just another tool that can be used, but simultaneously, going back to the access versus removing barriers, the barrier of people feeling as though they need something like this to be able to then participate, what is what needs to be removed, even if this gave me access. Now, Sakafo, I saw you unmute once again, so if you wanted to then... Oh, I just wanted to say thank you so much. So I know Judy very well. She's been a mom, yeah. As an advocate, um, international advocate, I know her very well. And maybe we will talk behind the scene after your presentation. And uh, I, I have polio from childhood, so I'll be sitting there for a long time. So I just thank you for these details. Absolutely, and I, and I tell people that there, there's nothing wrong with with sitting, right? There's absolutely nothing wrong with the fact that I may navigate the world now as a proud wheelchair user. And while I do use these resources that are available, I, I'm now trying to be more sensitive to then recognizing that that should not be the only way that people have access. And it's something that as a physician, you know, I, I grapple with this juxtaposition. I grapple with this sort of, you know, dynamic because especially as a physician that then also does work in physical medicine and rehabilitation, it's as if I am discouraging people from then sort of achieving whatever standard it is that they want to achieve. And, I, and I'm not doing so because many people in my life have you know, encouraged me to continue pressing on and trying to walk and doing the best I can to be upright. And my, my colleagues also feel as though, well, am I saying that the entire profession of rehabilitation is ableist? And I, and I will say no, right? Because I think that we can still work with individuals to optimize function to the best of their ability, right? While not negating the fact that there are individuals that will not be able to achieve that same level of physical function. And that should not be the limiting factor in them getting access to the same opportunities. And so you can, on one hand, encourage people to then work hard to then rehab. But I know that while I regain some motor function, my roommate at the Rehab Institute of Chicago, very similar injury, similar age, worked just as hard, if not harder than me, never regained physical function in his legs. And I do not want to then live in a world that makes it such that I have more access to things than he does because I was able to then regain function by no fault of my own, by no hard work of my own. Certainly I worked hard, but it was not because he didn't that he did not regain function. And once again, talking about individuals who are born into this world with disability, 
It should not be that they come into a world that already puts them behind, or as we've seen in those initial images, that they're already starting from a box-sized hole merely because of their disability. So thank you, Sakafor, for, for the question. Now, there are a few in the Q&A that I'm going to then read out and work with. Someone says, I work at a smaller liberal arts college with a College of Health Sciences. We have programs that prepare healthcare professionals as physician assistants and nursing. We are not connected to a hospital or medical college. Oftentimes, our faculty may come directly from practice. What type of experiences, curriculum, and considerations can we ensure are part of the experience to have the next generation of healthcare providers that are aware of accessibility and ableism, aware of their own biases, competent in knowing disability, competent healthcare practices and rights, et cetera? So that is a wonderful question, and thank you for asking that. First of all, I would say things like this that are then elevating the conversation about accessibility to then make sure people recognize it as something that should be valued, right? Because too often we don't talk about accessibility. We don't talk about disability. And in particular, for whatever reason in healthcare, healthcare should be the space and the place that is the most accessible. But for whatever reason, our own healthcare systems often fail at recognizing that they need to be accessible and inclusive to both patients and providers with disabilities. And so what I can do is I can, you know, encourage you to then to look at some of the things that exist. I'll, I'll use our program at the University of Michigan as just one example, not the best once again, but just the example of what I know. It's called M Disability, and our M Disability program is seeking to then increase the representation of individuals with disabilities in clinical practice, in research, in community engagement, and in education. And so, for example, there's a Docs with Disabilities podcast that Dr. Lisa Meeks has been the one responsible for really sort of pioneering. We have a disability health curriculum that our medical students are then able to then come to our, to our curriculum and they are interacting with people from a variety of different specialties that are focused on disability. We also have an, a summer internship that then exposes individuals to multiple aspects of sort of disability equity and inclusion with respect to the healthcare system. And then we have clinical programs such as, you know, one of our colleagues is Dr. Mike McKee and our chair, Dr. Philip Zazoff had a deaf health clinic that then is meant to not only then, they are both deaf providers themselves, but they also then provide care to the deaf community. And so I think that at first having a conversation and recognizing that disability should be a part of every institution's diversity plan, that disability is an aspect of diversity and that it should not be seen as pathology and that's something that's difficult within the healthcare system because we want to pathologize disability as a problem or something that needs to be rectified rather than understanding that disability is just another aspect of the human existence, the human experience. And all of us exist on some sort of continuum of able-bodied, non-disabled or disabled in some way. And so therefore, why we draw some line in the sand to then say, who is it that is disabled and who isn't and who deserves access and who doesn't, that to me is the difficult part, right? It goes back to once again, the beginning of these systemic constructs that then make people feel that disability is an inability, that disability is something that needs to be overcome in some way, rather than recognizing that disability is something that many, if not all of us may experience at some point in our lives. And if we strive for a more universally accessible experience, then we do not need to have as many conversations about providing accommodations to then provide access or to remove barriers. If we remove the barriers ahead of time, if we recognize that we can do things in a more accessible or inclusive way, then we'll get to a place where more people have that access. And so, you know, the phrase that I, I may have already said it earlier is that when you build that ramp instead, I say that everyone can use the ramp while not everyone can use the stairs. And so therefore, why are we not building more ramps to have access? You know, literally, whether you are a wheelchair user, whether you are a parent pushing a stroller, whether you are someone delivering a package, having that ramp will then provide you with access to this space. And I think in particular, over the past two years, people have seen that we can actually do more. We can do things in different ways. We were all forced to pivot drastically to this past COVID era, we were able to demonstrate how we could do things in different ways that we thought we couldn't do before. Education was provided in a virtual way for two years and people still graduated, people were still competent, people still had experiences. 
Now, I will say that surely there are certain situations in which a virtual experience is not going to then be equal to what it was that we would have had in person. But I think that people are now seeing that we can be more flexible, more innovative, more creative, and how we then sort of execute our pedagogical practices to then be able to then educate. But before, a lot of the things that individuals with disabilities were requesting in order to have access were being denied. But now we see that we can then be more creative in how we then provide that access in a way that is more accessible to individuals living with disability. Now I'll go to the, to the next question in the Q&A. As you mentioned, it seems that access, accessibility, and anti-ableist perspectives are deeply connected to lived experiences. Is there anything that you would recommend in being able to minimize ableist ideologies when advocating for students we may be working with? When advocating with students, we may be working with faculty, staff, and other campus partners who may not have had a lived experience themselves, particularly with invisible disabilities. Now, I think that that question is then saying, how do we minimize some of these ableist ideologies when we're going to be advocating for the students who are working with someone who doesn't have a lived experience of disability? So how can that student who may not have a preceptor or a faculty member who recognizes the importance of this, how do we advocate for them? Now, this is one of the things that I say that it does not and should not take you being a Black disabled man for you to then acknowledge racism or ableism. Because not everyone is going to have that lived experience. And in fact, we need individuals that do not have the lived experience to be able to then be allies in this conversation. I just gave a presentation yesterday to a group of sort of student affairs leaders from across the country, and we were talking about how we can get student organizations to then work better together. And it's because I think that for, for good reason, lots of people create silos in terms of the specific demographic group that they choose to identify with and support, right? But what we fail to recognize is what I call the intersecting Venn diagrams of our lived experiences and our identities. And that once again, it should not take you having to live an existence of disability to be able to support accessibility. Now, I came to this space, admittedly, only after living with disability. But the hope is that as I'm speaking to other individuals and I'm sharing my perspective, as to why we should make things more accessible and inclusive, that it's not something that resonates only with those individuals living with disability. And so the goal is that when we engage with people, one, I think it's very important not to then ostracize the individuals that do not identify with disability. Do not push people away and make them feel like it's their fault. And actually a phrase that I use is that the past may not be your fault, but the future will be. And so what is it that we can do to then make somebody's tomorrow better than their yesterday? And so when we can acknowledge the fact that we are now in an ableist system, just because you may not have recognized it before doesn't mean that you cannot acknowledge it now and strive to then provide access moving forward. But too often, I think that even people with or without the lived experience, they see that student with a disability and they think that they are lowering the bar to then provide that accommodation. They think that that individual with a disability is not good enough or should not deserve to then get this access. And oftentimes what they will even say or do is that we are just trying to then look out for this student. Because what we don't want to set them up for is failure. We don't want to then put them in a situation where they're not going to be able to then have access later on. And when they get into the real world, they're not going to be prepared. And so therefore, we want to then start to give them realistic expectations about what it is that they can achieve. Now, no one can tell someone else what it is that they will be able to achieve, and you should not then be the barrier to that success. And so if giving access to something is all it is that you can do, let that student have the access that they need to be able to demonstrate that they can be successful. So I tell all of our faculty here that our office and providing accommodations, we are not guaranteeing success by no means. That disabled student is still going to have to then put in their work to be successful. However, giving them that access is what they deserve. And to make it more visible, once again, as an example, I go back to physical accessibility. And let's talk about a building that has stairs to get in. No ramp, no lift, no elevator. So I live in the state of Michigan, and I can imagine on a winter day, let's say I need to enter a building, and there is no access, no, no, no ramp, no elevator, no lift. I could, I could conceivably, 
crawl up those stairs to then get into the building. My clothes would be torn, my hands would be cold, I would be wet, but I could get into the building. Now, I did not actually have access. And so giving me an accommodation by putting a chairlift, putting a ramp, putting an elevator to enter the building is giving me the access I deserve. But what has been happening to too many disabled students and too many disabled individuals for years is that when that access is not given, they find their way into that building somehow. And when they find their way into that building, it took 10 times as long and 10 times as much work for them to get there. But then when people see them there, they say, well, you've made it. And so therefore there was no barrier to your access. And if you were able to achieve that, then why do we need to give an accommodation? There should be no reason why I should be cold and wet and tattered and late when we can provide that access. And so any accommodation that I'm providing to a student is not an unfair advantage. Allowing a student to then have uh, extended time on an exam, allowing a student to have a distraction reduced environment, using an intermediary in some of the health sciences programs, we even used avatars for some of our virtual experience for students that on the basis of certain disability were not able to be in person for an event, but needed to participate. And so we've demonstrated the use of an avatar to be able to be there while the student was not there. There are lots of creative ways that we have then demonstrated that if the goal is to then assess this individual's ability to then master this material, we should then give that student access to the material in whatever way that we can. Now, the ADA and the law says that we must make a reasonable accommodation, and there are times where that accommodation may seem to be unreasonable. Now, that does not mean that we still are not able to then provide that, right? An institution can choose to provide an accommodation, but on the basis of the law, which is now getting a bit too sort of in, into the weeds, the law mandates that we provide reasonable accommodation. But as an instructor, as an individual course leader, you can do something that may have been considered unreasonable because you desire to provide access and that is fully within your rights to do so. So hopefully that answered that question. And I'll summarize once again is that in order to then advocate with and for these students, the goal is to get people to see that by providing these accommodations, by trying to give access, you are merely giving that student the opportunity to then demonstrate what it is that they can do. It is not that you are then giving them an unfair advantage or a leg up. It is that you're merely providing them with an opportunity to do something that every other student has access to doing without any additional accommodation needed. All right, next question. The WHO identifies products and technology barriers and also policies, services, and systems barriers. This standing frame chair approach illustrates the intersection of those two barriers or the success of the product for Dr. Okunlami reflects the intersection of facilitators, the existence of tech and the policies allowing him to access. Thank you very much. That, I think that was a comment less than it was a question, but hopefully everyone can see that and, and can hear that. And I appreciate that sort of uh, the intersection of bringing those two barriers together. And that same individual said that we need to teach people to examine their assumptions, question the necessity of doing things a prescribed way that is based on assumptions about the task and people instead of the analysis of the task. Thank you so very much. That is essentially what I was just trying to then articulate, is that rather than assessing or limiting someone based on what we think that they cannot do, if we then analyze that task, right, if we see how they're able to then accomplish something when then given equitable access to it, that is the way that we can then work these things. And this pandemic, I think the silver lining of the pandemic has then given us this opportunity to reevaluate what it is that we can do. And I would say in particular in the health sciences and in STEM fields and higher education, we can absolutely reevaluate the way that we have been doing this. Because over these past two years, as I said earlier, people have graduated with their PhD, with their MD, with insert whatever degree here, people have graduated because we found a way to then provide that access. And the unfortunate part is that it, it took a global pandemic to then give certain people access. And now what we, what many of us now in this work are trying to then do is maintain some of that flexibility that has been created because too many organizations are trying to swing the pendulum back over to what was being done prior to the beginning of the pandemic. To say that that was just a sort of an emergency use case and that is not something that we will continue to do. But hopefully we can maintain some of those things. 
I appreciate the comment about this anonymous attendee. I will not read that one out loud. It would just be uh, boosting myself up. But thank you, anonymous attendee, for that one. And then this one, how can we manage the needs and rights of the disabled community with that of the non-disabled community? I find that it's very difficult to balance. I find it's a very difficult balance, particularly when it comes to accommodating students in internships and practicums. Some students may experience impact of disability that can be very difficult to manage in certain settings. Now, now I'd say that that, that, is, that as a statement is 100% correct, is that yes, there may be certain accommodations that require additional resources, but some, like I said with the box example earlier, it does sometimes take more wood to build a ramp than it would to build a box to give people access. But I think that the fundamental question before we even talk about how much resource is needed is if the belief is that the student deserves the access. Because too often what is happening is that people feel as though, as I've said, we're lowering the bar. And so that is the reason why it becomes a, a, difficult, a difficult point to find appropriate resources. Now, when we then look at what we're doing to provide resource, you know, I, I use the example, and I used this yesterday, about people that talk about their, what they have the right to do and how, you know, one person's accommodation should not infringe upon another person's access. So talking about someone who has the right to swing around in a circle and spin their, hits and spin their hands, right? You can sp spin around in a circle, spinning your hands all day long, but your right to spin your hands stops at my face. So when your spinning of your hands strikes my face, that is no longer something that, is, that, is, that should be done. So there should be no accommodation that then, that then reduces access for another student. And so while you know, this is, I understand this is a question that has nuance to it and we would have to talk about specifics to be able to then get to detail, but an accommodation should not then disadvantage a student that does not have a disability. But I think what's important to recognize, however, is just like those slides, when we showed the image of the boxes and then the individual at the last image, you have the tallest individual not on any box or ramp, you have the medium individual that was standing on two boxes, and then you have the short individual standing, sitting on a ramp. In that scenario, there were different resources for people. For that individual that did not need any accommodation, they did not get any wood for a box or a ramp. And so it was not equal, but they did not have a barrier that needed to be sort of addressed. And so I think that is what happens. We talk about fairness sometimes, and we talk about what one person gets that the other person doesn't get. And that, that is not where that conversation should then be because not everyone needs the same access to then be able to, or not everyone needs the same resource to be able to have access. And there's some people that then don't need additional resources to have access at all. And so I think that that's how I, I will try to summarize that answer is that an accommodation by itself may be difficult to then achieve, but that does not mean that you're taking away from an individual that does not need an accommodation. And so as educators, as, as leaders, as a physician, I recognize that certain things may take more work for me to do them. But it doesn't mean that I feel as though I'm taking away from someone else by having to then do a bit more to provide access in this space. And so that is, I think that's what sort of the, the thread should be, is that as long as what you are doing is providing access for, for a student, then you should, not, you should not be jeopardizing the access for another student but sometimes people feel as though because they did not get something that it is unfair. But if there's no barrier, there's no reason to be providing some additional resource for someone who already has the resource. So hopefully that answered that question adequately. Next question is that how should individuals who have a non-invisible disability due to a chronic illness, due to a chronic illness to navigate the ongoing biases and assumptions regarding the individual's ability? There is the intersectionality of being black, female, navigating the education and work environment. Yes, thank you. So, and what I will first do is I will touch on intersectionality. And I, I take every opportunity to do this because often when people say intersectionality, people are referring to actually people having intersecting identities. Now, that is not what you are saying here. You are using intersectionality appropriately. But I think that sometimes people are just saying multiple identity groups when they say intersectionality. But intersectionality is actually a theoretical framework that is the belief and the understanding that individuals who identify with multiple marginalized identities have sort of an exponential impact of that bias and discrimination in their lives. So once again, individuals who identify with multiple marginalized identities 
the impact of those multiply marginalized identities is exponential on the discrimination and the prejudice that they experience. And so it's not, it's not just to say, oh, well, I identify with being this and that. It's saying that those two things and the prejudice that I experienced because of them is increased because of those two things. It's not even just like an additive effect. It's essentially an exponential effect. And so how should those, and, and, and I like to use just once again, I'm not saying that these are words that everyone should use, but I use non-apparent often because I think that I, I, I do not want people's disabilities to be seen as either visible or invisible because I think that that can sometimes go to this uh, belief that we are not being seen, right? It's just like when people say that I don't see color. I, I want you to see color and I am black. I want you to see my blackness. I want you to see my disability. And I think that that is something that just from my, from my perspective, I like to speak to. But so yes, I think that intersectionality is something that as we all recognize the fact that we have these systemic sort of things that have then created the prejudices that we all live in, being cognizant of that will then allow us to then identify and address the concerns that come up from intersectionality. Because I think that many of the themes that exist are what make this an exponential and additive impact on those of us that then have intersectional identities. And so by identifying each one of these and doing everything that we can to provide equitable access, by making sure that we do not judge or limit people based on their race, based on their gender, based on their ability status, and by making sure that we allow people not just to have a seat at the table, but also an opportunity to then speak. Because too often we speak for others rather than bringing them into the space and allowing them to then advocate for themselves. And so I think that, you know, this is a circuitous way to then get to that. But intersectionality is something that will be addressed by then each individual identifying the fact that we need to then recognize that each person deserves equitable access and that what that access looks like will be different and that the best way to understand what anybody needs is by asking them. Because when we make assumptions about what someone's needs are, when we make assumptions about what some person's ability is, you know, that is what gets us into hot water. And one can say from a system level, you can't ask everyone what they need. But that's why striving for a universal design is what is going to then allow people to then have a system that is more accessible and inclusive. So I know that we're coming up on our last minute here. And the truth is, as I said, you know, there are a few more slides that could have been shown, but I think that the direction that this conversation went in was the direction that the participants desired. So hopefully this was appropriate. I will summarize by saying the goal of trying to then say that we are disabusing disability is just to demonstrate that disability is not inability. And the way that we can do that is that this last slide I'll show here is to then reconceptualize what equitable opportunities may look like. Now, people say that this is a, you know, an insurmountable task because there's so many different ways to provide access. But what I say to each person is that every single one of us has an ability to do something within our own sphere of influence. And so all that I did with my work in my life was I took the things that I was passionate about. And another phrase I use is find and follow your passions and make your passions your professions. And so I talked about how I was an athlete in college. I talked about being a physician. And now I talk about what the work that I do at the University of Michigan, at UCLA, on some of the organizations that I'm a part of, is trying to then provide these equitable opportunities that people have not been given on the basis of disability, on the basis of their race, on their basis of whatever barrier has been then put in front of them. And so if we within our spheres of influence do something to try to make someone's tomorrow better than their yesterday, if we recognize that we are no better than any other individual, and that disability does not mean that this person is unable to do anything, then we can strive to then provide the adequate resources that people need to be able to demonstrate how successful they can be. So that is our time. I wanna thank you all for your questions. I thank you for this opportunity to present to you, and I hope that the rest of the conference goes swimmingly. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's Natalie Roach, back Assistant Director for Accessibility Services. I just want to say a very, very, very big thank you to Dr. Okunlami for that keynote. 
Um, really appreciate it. And also really appreciating your responsiveness and engagement with the audience. I think that that was something, as you said, um, responding to kind of the needs as they arose. So I just want to say uh, a hearty thank you um, for that and for um, being so uh, responsive. Again, much appreciated. Okay. So we are going to move into our break. So uh, we will see you back here at 10.15 sharp for our next session, um, which we are very much looking forward to. See you shortly, everyone. Welcome back, everyone. My name is Leah Potash. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm an accessibility advisor on the on location team at Accessibility Services St. George campus. I am a white woman in my early 40s with brown hair, brown shoulder length hair, and I'm wearing a striped t shirt. My Zoom background is of an office space going to move on to our access check. We understand access to be a shared responsibility between everyone in this space. We will strive to create an accessible space that will reduce the need for you to disclose a disability or impairment for the purposes of gaining an accommodation. In doing this together, we strive to welcome disability and the changes it brings into our space. Is there anything about the virtual space that we should address now? Are there any other access needs that might affect your participation in the workshop that we could also address? On the next slide, we will go over how you can submit a response to either of these two questions, as well as for the rest of the conference. Next slide, please. Throughout the conference, all speakers will describe visual elements as best as they can. We welcome participants to turn off their camera, get up and move around and take as many screen breaks as they need to throughout the conference. The slide shows a visual of the Zoom control at the bottom of your screen. Use the Q&A to support to submit questions for the presenters or if you experience any technical difficulties and require assistance. You are able to submit questions anonymously. If you prefer to, to ask your question live, you can raise the hand feature and you will be asked to unmute yourself. Keyboard users use option um, and capital Y on a Mac or alt Y on Windows. Most users, select participants, choose raise hand at the bottom of the panel. We respectfully request that you wait until the designated question period to ask questions using either the Q&A or the raise hand feature. Note that moderators may not be able to get to all questions. We are real-time captioning the entire conference. To enable text captioning, click on the live transcript and select show subtitles. Text captioning is auto-enabled on mobile devices. We also have sign language interpreting for the entire conference, which is available to you on laptop and desktop computers. Please submit a question via the Q&A feature if you are experiencing any te technical difficulties. I'm now uh, very pleased to, to introduce um, our facilitators of our next session, Reshma Drodia, and Janelle Anderson. Reshma Drodia is a social worker and educator whose work focuses on equity, diversity, inclusion, gerontology, and gender-based violence. Since 2016, she has worked in the University of Toronto St. George Campus Accessibility Services Office 
to accommodate students with disabilities. She is the chair of their EDIA committee and team lead of 11 on-location accessibility advisors. In 2021, she received the Jill Mattis Excellence in Student Services Award and Excellence Through Innovation Award. She is on the board of directors for the Urban Alliance on Race Relations and the Leonard Foundation. Janelle Anderson is the on-location accessibility advisor at University College U of T. She is a black disabled social worker and researcher focusing on disability affirming therapy and equity-based research with marginalized populations, particularly those with intersection of blackness, disability and immigration. Her latest work examines gaps in research policy and service delivery for Black Canadians with disabilities titled The Intersection of Blackness and Disability. She has a background in community engaged research with Black survivors of homicide victims. I'm now gonna pass it on to Reshma and Janelle to introduce the student panelists. Thank you so much, Leah. Um, just to give a visual description, I am a Black woman, I'm wearing braids today and the jean shirt and I'm sitting in front of a, pri a progress pride flag uh, virtual background. Um, so the first of panelists I'd like to introduce is Fatima. Uh, Fatima Hassan is a third year uh, mechanical engineering student at the University of Toronto. Um, she is from Toronto and Fatima is interested in engineering and teaching. She has done some work with the Engineering Outreach Office and has been a part of the Engineering Society. She also loves photography and music. Oh, Rush, you want me to keep going? Okay. Um, so next is Olivia. Um, Olivia Wallace is a visual artist and teacher from Brampton, Ontario who recently completed the Master of Teaching program at OISE U of T. She holds an Honors Bachelor of Arts in Arts Management, Studio in Art History, and was awarded the Orpheus Prize in Humanities in 2017 from UTSC. Olivia has worked with several arts organizations and galleries, and currently sits on the Programming and Collections Committee at Peel Art Gallery um, Museum and Archives. She is passionate about art education and community-based art, and her research has focused on socially engaged hip-hop in multi-ethnic schools. And lastly, we have Lauren. Lauren is a current uh, Master of Social Work student at the University of Toronto, finishing their first year of the two-year program in mental health and um, health and mental health stream. Lauren has also been working with accessibility services um, as both a peer advisor and peer facilitator since September of 2020. Lauren identifies as a student with a disability and is an advocate for accessibility within academic and professional programs. Thank you so much, Janelle. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, just uh, please just punch that everyone could be here, including our wonderful panelists. Um, I do want to take a second to describe myself a bit further and something that I didn't mention in my uh, professional uh, bio, which uh, is interesting for me to reflect on, is that I'm also a childhood survivor and have uh, utilized mental health services through um, large chunks of my life. And so um, the other parts of me, uh, to describe myself visually, I am a South Asian woman, I have brown skin, uh, my hair at this time is long and wavy and blondish, I'm wearing a pinkish lipstick today and a long sleeved black top. My Zoom background features pride colors and feathers uh, in honor of both uh, Pride Month and National Indigenous History Month. The image uh, is from a Two-Spirit Ojibwe artist named Patrick Hunter, um, who is from Red Lake, Ontario. And so before we uh, delve into uh, the uh, questions that uh, we have for our panelists today, I did want to take a moment just to ground ourselves in um, why we wanted to make sure that there was space and time to have this conversation, as well as to ground ourselves in a definition of ableism um, that we hope really uh, speaks to the uh, and addresses the intersectional nature of how ableism operates and impacts folks. And so um, students with disabilities in professional programs have often described uh, and experienced barriers to their growth and achievements, um, certainly, I can um, 
attest to that myself. Uh, and uh, we know that the students that we have been working with within our office at the St. George campus who are professional uh, students who also identify as uh, Black, Indigenous, or racialized uh, have talked about their experiences as quite challenging in a number of ways. Such barriers, uh, as was addressed in the keynote this morning, may be attitudinal, financial, physical, technological, or appear in some other way, or manifest in some other way. And so when we talk about disability, um, it's often discussed as a single issue identity, thereby erasing the experiences of BIPOC persons with disabilities. And so we wanted to offer a working definition of ableism by Talula L. Lewis that we feel captures the complexity of ableism, its nuances, its relationships with other forms of oppression and discrimination, and firmly places it within historic and systemic contexts to ground us in the realities of our students' lives and the work that needs doing and undoing. And so we're, we're happy to share this link in the chat in a little bit, um, but I will read it out now. Ableism, according to Talila L. Lewis's working definition, is a system that places value on bodies, uh, people's bodies and minds based on societally constructed ideas of normality, intelligence, excellence, desirability, and productivity. These constructed ideas are deeply rooted in anti-Blackness, eugenics, misogyny, colonialism, imperialism, and capitalism. This form of systemic oppression leads to people and society determining who is valuable and worthy based on a person's language, appearance, religion, and or their ability to satisfactorily reproduce or produce, excel, and behave in quotation marks. You do not have to be disabled to experience ableism. Thank you so much. We will put that link in the chat and it's now over to Jenna. Thank you, Rush. And so to start off the panel, um, we'll ask, can you, uh, the panelists, to talk about their connection uh, between, you know, your experiences of disability as well as your experience as a racialized or Black student. And we'll ask Lauren to start us off. Great, thank you. So when thinking of this question and like the connection between disability and Blackness, the one thing that always sticks out for me is just how already being perceived one way is something that I kind of don't like. So to have kind of being perceived in two different ways is something that is very intersectional for me. And a lot of the times, depending on the context, I may only be perceived one way and not the other. So for example, although I am disabled, it is an invisible disability. So um, I am visually black, like I do pass as black when I'm able to be perceived. So that's usually the first thing that people notice about me rather than my disability. So a lot of the times, some of my disability needs may be perceived as something else just because of my race. So, um, for example, I'm not very keen on making eye contact. It makes me quite uncomfortable and it is an accessibility need that I do utilize. Um, but just because I don't look disabled, a lot of the times I come off as rude and um, impassive just because I'm not able to make eye contact. And I get a lot of those stereotypes a lot due to the color of my skin. So there is kind of that connection that I would say between, um, personally for me, between racialized and um, also being disabled. Thank you so much, Lauren. Uh, Fatima, over to you. Um, so, as a description, I'm a South Asian woman, um, and I have long black hair. Um, so, my experiences of being racialized and having a disability um, very much came out in just the kind of environment around me in um, high school and university. Um, be, I'm as a child of immigrant parents, I was also an immigrant, um, but like as a child. Um, so navigating the world, you know, as a racialized person with disability, um, my experiences were very hard for me. 
to be able to relate with other people on both fronts, it was very um, rare for me. And I've only found people now, peers, who I'm actually able to relate to on a level that connects with multiple areas rather than just, you know, either being a woman or either having a disability. And especially in professional programs or in kind of situations where culture and family values and stuff like that come in, um, it's just kind of isolating on that front. And so that's kind of the most where I felt the connection between both of these identities really come into play, especially during such um, experiences where you need support, going through university, figuring out you have a disability, you know, really um, situations where there's been attacks on my community and yeah, really kind of that environment. Thank you, Fatima. And Olivia, over to you. So oh, hi, I'm Olivia. I'm a black woman in my late 20s. Uh, my hair is in twists and it's in a high bun today. Uh, so for me, um, yeah, I think one of the hardest things or one of the things I was in my mind often was this, um, I guess it's called like stereotype threat. So not wanting my behavior to align with certain stereotypes. And so I would often uh, want to mask uh, my health issues uh, because I wanted to be seen as just as capable as uh, my classmates and my peers who were predominantly white or um, racialized but not black. So, so yeah, I think stereotype threat was something that kind of um, impacted me in terms of being anxious about my behavior. Um, in 2019, I was diagnosed with leukemia. I uh, had to go through a lot of uh, chemotherapy, uh, radiation, bone marrow transplant, and all of those treatments led to a lot of side effects. And for me, it was very um, unpredictable, like not knowing how my body would, would react and how I would get through the program, uh, but often feeling like I needed to hide that experience because I just wanted to be seen as equal to my peers. Thank you, Olivia. I'll hand it over to Rush. Thanks, everyone. So the next question that we have for you is around the identities that you hold. And so considering the various identities you hold, including your identities as professional program students or now graduates, um, what are some of the concerns that you had as you began your professional program? And so maybe we'll start with you, Olivia, if that's okay. Yeah, so for me, um, so I started my program in 2020. And uh, while COVID did present a lot of uncertainty, it also gave me an opportunity to participate uh, virtually. Um, and for me, I don't know if I would have been able to complete the program if I needed to be in person. And so, yeah, that was it actually ended up being um, something that was, for me, a blessing in disguise to be online. I never saw myself as an online learner, but um, having all the health concerns that I did have, um, being able to be online was was a big blessing to me. Uh, and I was also concerned about, will I actually get through the program? And unfortunately, uh, the Master of Teaching program does not have a part-time option. So I really thought that it would be important for me to seek accommodations uh, and to figure out a plan as to how I would get through the program. And so working with an accessibility advisor, I was able to come up with a plan in terms of how I would uh, navigate the program. And yeah, so for me, I would say being registered with accessibility services was an, as important was an important step for me to take. And it was something that um, my peers weren't necessarily aware of. So that was something that um, I was comfortable with because I was able to um, access that, but not necessarily have to disclose um, that to my peers. 
And um, yeah, which disclosing it could have kind of heightened that um, anxiety that I, that I experienced. Thank you, Olivia. And certainly, um, I know Janelle and I can attest to the fact that disclosure and stigma is a, a big conversation that we continue to have with students and the, the uh, importance of protecting folks' privacy. Um, thank you. Uh, Fatima, would you like to respond to the question that we asked? Yeah, so um, when I was joined my engineering program, it was thankfully very racially diverse. So on that front, I had a little bit of um, more sense of community, um, but that also had a bit of a pro and con. And in the con side is that, you know, being disabled and being a child of immigrant or being an immigrant, um, there's always this drive to, you know, achieve. And especially if your families do not want to let down your family and all the struggle that immigrants go through to set foot in a new country. Um, and in a program where there's a lot of international students, lots of immigrants and lots of immigrant children, that culture really comes through as well of, you know, pushing through, not taking a break in a professional program such as engineering um, even has a cultural perception of being a very driven program. You need, it's like very tough. Um, so it was hard. My concern was I only started finding out about my disability in the first year that I entered the program. And it took me a couple of years to even connect with accessibility services, to even reach out for support because of this culture created and this internal pressure and expectations and values of you know, needing to succeed and not being able to slow down or let anyone down. And engineering being an accredited program, it also felt very difficult to even be able to take a break without having to extend my studies an entire year um, when other people around me weren't going through the same thing. And so, yeah, but like, thankfully, a plus of this diverse population was that I had, I think for the first time, people in my close friend group who I could speak with about my home life, my, how, how the school pressure was facing me, how, you know, like, this all played into the bigger nuance of my existence without having to explain a lot of it. It was just implicitly understood. And I think feeling that for the first time was a very big plus and a very big important thing that made me realize how much I was actually missing, not connecting with people who had similar experiences, who were racialized and then who were also disabled. Thank you, Dr. Marie. You've uh, spoken so beautifully about the importance of community um, and uh, also harking to just how isolated folks can feel. Over to you, Lauren. Uh, any concerns that you had as you began your professional program? Yeah, I think my biggest concern was probably just imposter syndrome and seeing how I could handle that. So um, I also did my undergraduate at U of T and um, I didn't have a lot of folks who were like me, um, especially um, in the program that I chose, there weren't a lot of BIPOC folks. So kind of having to seek out that community and having a lot of them being in different programs, there wasn't a lot of overlap. But um, fortunately, when I joined social work, there was a lot more racial diversity, which is great. But as Fatima was saying, um, like when the disability kind of came into play, I wasn't really finding a lot of folks who had similar experiences, especially at that intersection. So I had a lot of feeling left out. And then in terms of the imposter syndrome, it felt very hard to ask for things just because I felt like I had already been asking for a lot when I'm already asking for the faculty to acknowledge racism. I don't wanna turn around and then ask for them to acknowledge ableism. And it felt a lot of the times where I had to pick and choose my battles and pick and choose what was the most important thing to me at that time. Um, 
So I was really concerned coming into social work and having to do that same battle, especially now when it becomes a professional program and the classes are a bit smaller and, and more intimate, um, having to kind of put myself out there to say, well, you know, this isn't accessible for me. It's kind of like I'm, I'm putting a target on my back and then to kind of bring up racism in a room of folks who may not have even realized that was racist because nobody else black. It feels like, um, you know, the spotlight is on me and that's definitely not something that I enjoy too much. So my biggest concern is that I would always have to be advocating for the bare minimum that a lot of folks don't have to advocate for just because they look different, are different. And, um, you know, I really didn't want that to fall on me. Um, so I'd say, yeah, that's my biggest, well, that was my biggest concern coming in. Thank you, Lauren. And certainly the pressures of always feeling like you have to be your advocate, but also the advocate of the others, uh, whether or not they're in the space, uh, can be quite exhausting. And the particular expectations of what it means to be a social worker and who can be a social worker. Um, thank you. Over to you, Janelle. Thank you. And what was your experience in, in finding a practicum or placement in your professional program? that was suitable to your needs as a student with disability. Um, as well, what, what are some ways that the practicum offices could help with outlining accessibility at placements? I will start with Olivia. Yeah, so for me, finding a placement um, during COVID was challenging in, in and of itself, but then being, um, trying to consider uh, being immunocompromised and weighing the risks. Um, so initially I was hoping to um, do my final practicum uh, virtually. However, there are certain expectations from the Ontario College of Teachers. Uh, so I had to decide, was I willing to take this risk and to go into a classroom? And thankfully, um, I had an accessibility advisor who I could discuss this with uh, and and talk about, okay, what could I do for, for placement? And so um, she was able to put together a letter and submit that um, so that I could have certain accommodations that would limit my exposure to COVID-19. And uh, yeah, so I think it would, I would recommend that U of T and OIZ would have a more um, explicit way of like be more explicit about accommodations with practicum so maybe having a an information session or some sort of professional development for students who have a disability that would help them to understand what their options are in terms of placement uh, because for me it felt like um, and specifically I think in professional programs in particular, they seem to be very rigid. There are these requirements and often these requirements exclude students who are experiencing um, both visible and invisible disabilities that may be, you know, temporary or permanent. So I think it's important for OIC to think about how can they accommodate these students better uh, having part-time options. Um, and I think that that the all the staff at OISE as well, you know, should think about accessibility when they're talking with students because a lot of the times students are stressed out, they want to find a placement. And sometimes it feels like you're getting really vague answers or you're not getting the information that you want, um, which contributes to more anxiety. So I would say um, having an accessibility advisor was really helpful uh, because certain things you don't want to discuss with your professors because they're assessing you or you don't want to discuss it with your associate teacher or whoever is um, leading you in your practicum because they might be a potential reference and you don't want to be seen as incapable. So it's really awkward not knowing what can I disclose. So walking students, walking students through that all those different awkward things 
um, that come up with disability and professional programs, um, training them would be something that I would recommend for U of T. Thank you so much, Olivia. And again, like really strong theme from all of you from the beginning till now, it's like this whole idea of what professionalism is and what you mentioned that it often excludes how uh, disabled people kind of move through this world, um, that we're not considered professional. And I, I love that you brought that up. Um, Lauren, over to you. Thank you. Um, the one thing I'd like to highlight is um, when I was looking for my practicum, rather for my first year practicum in social work, what happens is you just pick um, 10 listings that are already on the website and then you just get randomly assigned one. They're not ranked or anything. So um, you have to pick 10 viable uh, listings. And a lot of the time, like especially if you're seeking accommodation, there may not be 10 viable listings even there. Um, one, it's kind of just like this web page and you can click which one it will give you information and the information is quite brief. It will talk a lot about kind of what types of social work you're doing, but not exactly what's expected of you. And I think that's really important, especially when it comes to accessibility needs, um, because it won't say anything that there is a physical accessibility need. It won't even say that the location doesn't have an elevator or anything like that. Um, for example, my practicum um, was in a hospice and it was on site. So I went there for a couple weeks and then they told me five or six weeks in that I also had to make house calls. And those house calls were in um, houses that didn't have elevators or I'd have to walk over, you know, things. I'd have to be able to be mobile and um, I was able to do that, but that doesn't mean that everybody is able to do that. And that was not alerted to me before I took that practicum. So it's very important that we are making sure that accommodation needs are being met. And then also nobody is being set up to fail because these are very easy to put in place to say that the hospital has an elevator, that this um, law office has seven stairs up to the door. These are, you know, very baseline information that needs to be there. The second thing is that um, within my practicum office's website, they had um, a checkbox kind of sense that kind of said that the practicum was inclusive to BIPOC um, and LGBTQ plus folks. And the three answers were yes, no, and uh, just like not, like not, like they didn't answer. Um, I had never seen a no, but I had seen a lot of folks who just did not answer. And to see that checkbox, the first thought that I had was I was hoping that perhaps all of the practicums would be um, BIPOC and LGBTQ plus inclusive because that's what the university is striving for. But to have that box be unchecked or, you know, kind of left alone put a lot of dread into me just to, you know, why exactly was that box left unchecked? Um, and it limited options, right? So when we're thinking of the intersection, like the intersection of Black and disabled, um, if I'm not able to meet accommodation needs at a lot of places, and then I have these other places that um, have not confirmed that they are BIPOC friendly, and I have to pick 10 practicums and there's only 100, I have so many less options than everybody else will. And it's kind of just, you know, putting in the legwork for these students. We already have to pick practicums. We have to research it. But then, you know, students who are disabled, students who are experiencing racism, they have to research even more to make sure that they can just go to their practicum safely. So I think for the practicum office to take kind of, especially the weight of the accessibility off would be the bare minimum. I don't think that it's appropriate. Um, to leave those things out, especially when this is something that is required of the student to graduate. You need to complete your practicum and they should be making sure that everybody is able to meet those accommodation needs there. Wow, thanks Lauren. I think that's amazing. You know, you highlighting um, the importance of having accessibility statements um, so that uh, students with disabilities are able to make the decision um, themselves of what they need or what kind of accommodations, like thinking about it beforehand rather than coming into the practicum and being met with like, 
and an inaccessible environment. Um, but additionally, you really did highlight the extra labor that students, um, BIPOC students, go through to like select a practicum. Um, you know, I appreciate that. And over to you, Resh. Uh, thank you, Janelle. So um, I promise we're not leaving Fatima out unnecessarily. Uh, Fatima hasn't yet done a placement, may uh, do some work with professional engineering here, but uh, we will be back to including Fatima in the uh, question period shortly. Um, this next uh, is a multi this next question is a bit of a multi-parter. Um, and so it's over to Olivia and Lauren again. And we'll start with you, Olivia. Um, so the, the main question is about challenges accessing or using accommodations in your placement or practicum. Um, and we'll start with that basic question and then um, add to it whether the challenges that you experienced, uh, Olivia, heightened uh, or were further exacerbated by your experiences as a Black student. Yeah, thanks. So one of the... Um, stereotypes that some of you might be familiar with is the strong black woman uh, woman stereotype and it may seem like a positive stereotype but really there are no positive stereotypes and I feel and I found that I was probably perceived as that which at times I felt unsupported because of that and um, there were times where I really wanted help or wanted more advice or guidance, especially during my practicum. Um, but I felt like uh, I was put into this box of strong black women who can manage a lot. And so if I felt like I was left alone um, at times. And so when I started my placement, actually, uh, I didn't think I thought I was concerned about my health, but I just thought, you know what, like hopefully my body will be okay and I'll be fine. And I went into uh, my first day of practicum and when I came and I was fine during the school day, but when I came home, I started feeling all of these like very painful um, feelings in my body, just being overwhelmed by the day and my body not being used to um, being out for like eight hours a day. So at that point, I felt overwhelmed. I didn't know what to do. Um, I wanted to be, you know, strong. I wanted to be professional. But at the same time, I knew that I couldn't continue. Uh, I couldn't keep up with the demands. Uh, so I felt like the only way that I would be accommodated was to explicitly share you know, my struggles with my health. And I didn't necessarily want to disclose all that information, but I felt like that was the only way for um, like some U of T staff and for my, um, the people who are managing my practicum to understand the extent of my struggle. And so I was also negotiating this thought of how am I going to be perceived how might this impact me in terms of employment? If I say that this is too much for me, um, how will this Im impact potential references? Will I be seen as incapable? So I, I knew that I needed help and I knew that I wouldn't be able to keep up with the demands. Um, so ultimately I chose to disclose um, just how painful, um, how or how much pain I was experiencing after my first year of practicum. Thank you, Olivia, and just acknowledging that you are also um, choosing to, to share th about this uh, very openly and, and just uh, expressing a lot of gratitude um, for your willingness to, to share some of your story with us. Um, I'm, I'm going to uh, continue with you if that's okay, just for the next couple of questions relating to the challenges around practicum. Um, were there challenges that you encountered when communicating your accommodations in particular? So you've talked already about the fact that you felt like you needed to disclose more despite you being registered with accessibility services. Were there other types of communication challenges? Uh, yeah, I'd say uh, just sometimes feeling like I'm just getting, and, and I will say that I know that 
um, the practicum office was having a challenging time due to COVID. Uh, so I know that a lot of students were reaching out to them, not just me. So I do acknowledge that. Um, I did find, however, um, when I joined Access Pathways for Black Educators, which is a new initiative um, that OISE has started up, uh, I found that the communication was a lot stronger um, because I was in a smaller group uh, and a very specific uh, group of Black students, Black educators. It was um, easier for me to communicate. I, I had my uh, practical coordinator calling me and you know discussing things with me over the phone uh, whereas prior to that I was just getting really brief um, general emails that didn't really help with the anxiety I was experiencing so uh, so I'm, I'm really grateful for access pathways for black educators uh, because it did allow me to um, yeah it, it created a safer space for me to to participate in practicum to uh, share my concerns, to actually have conversations with my practicum coordinator, because otherwise uh, the practicum coordinator is overwhelmed with so many students that they're not able to meet uh, specific needs maybe as much as they would like to. So Access Pathways was definitely um, really helpful for me in my journey and at OISE and uh, with practicum in particular. Thanks, Olivia, just um, really highlighting the importance of these access programs, not just within, you know, uh, pre-university, but throughout the undergraduate experience, graduate and professional program experience. Um, just in the interest of time, uh, Lauren, if it's okay, um, if you can talk a little bit about challenges that you might have had accessing or using accommodations in general, um, and whether you felt those challenges were exacerbated uh, by your experience as a Black student. Yeah, so um, I never uh, really used accommodations in my practicum formally, just because um, I didn't really feel like it was like appropriate or I guess like the need that I had to just because of where I was and my social my social worker um, who I was like shadowing was also very accommodating. So I was able to speak to him informally just about what, what I needed so I never really requested them formally. Um, my only issue with that was that when I started moving around just for some background I was in a hospice and I was usually following um, this one social worker but sometimes I would move to a different floor if he had to do something and then I would be following another social worker. Um, that's where it started to get a little bit different just because since my accommodation needs weren't really just um, formal, um, I would have to either disclose to the new people who I've been put with or kind of just go through with it. And a lot of the times I just kind of went with it, um, which uh, did work out for me. But I think at the end, I started experiencing a lot of burnout just because I was doing things that um, I was able to do, but it took a lot of energy um, just because, you know, it's not something that I, I usually had done just because I had been accommodated before. Um, in terms of disclosure, it's not really something that I did a lot just because it felt quite intimate to do. And just with the terms of my disability being invisible, a lot of the times when you do ask for accommodations and you don't look a certain way that people expect you to, they ask a lot of questions. Um, and a lot of the times they either just don't really take less information as an answer or they think um, different things. So if I said like, you know, I have a lot of issues with um, reading social cues and making eye contact and when they ask why and I don't disclose, they might just come off as that being more of like a rude personality. Um, so I kind of was sitting at this foreground of saying, is it worth it to disclose and then have to keep going? Or is it worth it to just say my accommodations and then be perceived negatively? Or is it worth it to kind of just continue as usual? And I think that was the dance that I did through my practicum when I wasn't with my supervisor. Um, just, and I, I would pick and choose what was most appropriate. And that also did work 
in terms of clients, because um, as a social work student, I was facing a lot with clients. So in terms of like accessibility needs, um, not asking with them, but kind of just putting in place before I interacted with them. Um, I did not use those at all, just because I felt as if I wouldn't have been quite supported in that way. Thank you, Lauren. And what you've highlighted um, um, in such a, uh, an important way is the ways in which um, there are, you're doing the dance around communication. So who are you picking and choosing to disclose to? Are you seeking, you know, accommodations informally? Uh, there are pros and cons to that. And then what about uh, the formal process and appreciating that there are pros and cons to that as well. Um, and that everyone has to make that decision independently. Um, thank you so much. Just in the interest of time, we'll move on to, to number five and we'll get Fatima a chance to answer some questions. Thanks, Rash. And um, folks, what do you wish the folks accommodating you knew about your experience as a racialized or black student in a professional program who's requesting and managing accommodations. So thinking about folks such as your accessibility advisor, uh, the practicum office contacts, uh, your practicum preceptor or supervisor, professors, or your peers. Oh, we'll start with Fatima. Yeah, so um, the place, or not place, but like, within the options given where I felt this the most was I could really see when my professors made a noticeable effort as compared to just, you know, the bare minimum, like in syllabus, in syllabi, so this is, um, whenever there's, there's a little section for accessibility services, um, you can clearly tell when it's the same like copy pasted blurb that accessibility services exist. And then but that doesn't really do anything. It was, in my experience, it was literally life-changing when one of my calculus professors had in his syllabus, like it stated, it's not about a getting an unfair advantage. It's about overcoming or making, like making sure that you're on equal footing based on an unfair disadvantage. And just taking him, taking that little bit of time to word something so personally and like, humanize in a humanizing manner really did change my entire perception of it. I literally would not have connected to accessibility services without it. So, um, you know, like apart from professors giving accommodations, which is also an area I've had thankfully a very positive experience in, um, just taking the time beforehand to, you know, make the space as Reshma put it, when we spoke earlier, um, expecting disability to be in the room, you know, like you have students who are going to be disabled. If, even if it's a temporary disabled, like if it, if someone breaks their arm, you know, being on the engineering society as an academic director, there were so many times within the academic advocacy committee that I was part of, that there were students who would just come forth with, you know, like, like so many concerns about just the cold and a temporary um, like thing that happened that it prevented them from being able to work at their full capacity. Just so much worry in this program about not being able to give 110% all the time. And I think it's like really important for people in positions of power within the faculty, within um, and thankfully the accessibility office in my accessibility services in my experience has been very, very good about this. Just being very mindful of the fact that students, you know, like this worry is just on your head all the time, especially if you're disabled, like it's just on your head all the time. And I guess it's like not really following the scope of the question at this point, but just making sure that, you know, being humanizing about people's experiences, making sure that if you're a professor or you're someone in a supporting position, that you're taking this extra step to see your students as human beings, see their experiences as struggles of human beings, and just taking that extra step to really empathize and cover that ground, you know, of making like you are perceiving the struggle, not pretending that it doesn't exist. That makes sense. Thanks, Fatima. And 
again, echoing that piece that you mentioned about, you know, a simple reframing of accommodations of disability was so impactful and it was just such a simple gesture, but it made the huge difference in kind of breaking down attitudinal barriers and like you mentioned, humanizing uh, disability. Thank you. And then I'll hand it over to Olivia. Yeah, I'd say um, something that I wish people knew uh, was that, yes, I am capable and I need accommodations. So um, just understanding that, you know, having a disability or a health challenge um, doesn't mean that you're not capable, uh, but we just need to make sure that those who have those experiences are able to participate in a way that works for them. And I would really um, also want to just commend the work that accessibility advisors are doing because they're literally changing people's lives and their trajectory in terms of whether they can continue school or not. I think for me, if I wasn't registered with accessibility and didn't have uh, that support, I may have opted to just defer or, you know, not continue with the program. So uh, I just want to say thank you to the accessibility advisors and the work that the accessibility office does. Um, and yeah, I would say in terms of like OIC staff and, and, and faculty, uh, I think just being really clear and um, even over communicating sometimes to ensure that students understand um, like what their options are and what's expected of them. And because I found a lot of times like when I felt like I was in crisis, trying to find information was very challenging. I had to like try to find the right email or like, I feel like it should be really accessible, easy information to find. And students should also just know these things because professors talk about accessibility in their courses. So, so yeah, I'd say just being clear and um, yeah, just making accessibility a, a part of everyday discussion throughout um, the program. Thank you, Olivia. I love that yes and statement. Um, just kind of, again, reframing disability and what disability looks like um, as well. Uh, thank you for that comment again about being transparent and um, allowing folks to just know what their options are as you know, folks with disabilities. Because um, information, although sometimes it's there, it's just not always readily accessible. And Lauren, over to you. Yeah, thank you. I think that um, one of the most important things is like Olivia said, just like bringing accessibility and also accessibility services to like the forefront, especially of the program. Um, I started the my master's program in September of 2021. And I think maybe at like in August at one of those like introduction, they kind of spoke about accessibility services. And then in all of the syllabus, they had, you know, like, oh, register for accessibility services if needed. And then like, it was never really talked about again. And I think, you know, that's just the bare minimum, like they are advertising it. But um, as we've all been saying before, like disability does come and go for some folks. And, you know, you might break your arm in January and have no idea where to go because all of the information was sent out once in August. So it's very important to make sure that this information is readily available. And also that, you know, there is some equity in the program rather than equality, you know, maybe sending out one mass email is great for some folks, but it may not be the best information gathering source for everyone else or rather other people. Um, and I think one thing that I would like to say is in my practicum, I was paired with a um, Black supervisor. And I feel as if that learning experience to me was very beneficial because I was kind of learning how to be a Black social worker. And I know that sounds a little bit strange, but when it comes to like just inherent racism that you face, it really is important to understand what's going on. And I bring this up because a lot of the times when I was working, not a lot, but sometimes 
I had experienced like microaggressions and racism within the workplace from clients towards both my supervisor and I. And um, he understood and he would, you know, explain it to me, explain what he would do. And we kind of went through it. But thinking back to it, I don't know how I would have explained how uncomfortable I was if my supervisor was white or I, if I had to explain, um, you know, the racism and why the client was mad at me and stuff like that. So to have that experience is really important. And where I'm going with this is that there really is no option to know you like anything really about the supervisors in your program unless they decide to disclose. And I think it would be very awesome if, you know, the practicum office could, you know, if the supervisor would like to offer them the option to talk about, you know, identities and the clientele that they are serving, because I think, you know, for safety concerns and anything like that, it may be good to have that and then also have the experience to work with like-minded people, with people who experience um, the same intersections that you do. I really did appreciate that. So I'd say the two things, advocating and like pushing accessibility services throughout the year, making it readily available knowledge for, for the faculty would be my first one. And then the second one is that if they could offer more of, you know, not forcing anybody, but pushing for these supervisors to be able to say exactly um, their inter intersectionalities or anything just about them so we can connect to them as humans rather than just like potential supervisors would be amazing, I think, when picking practicum. Thanks, Lauren, and thanks for sharing your experience and really highlighting um, why representation is important and having um, someone like a mentor or a supervisor who's reflective of your identities. Um, I rush. <laughs> All right, so we have about five minutes or so and then we're gonna uh, leap into questions. Um, and so perhaps um, folks can, Think about one or two things that you would uh, share because uh, you've all been uh, lovely about already talking about some recommendations and that's what we're going to end with. Um, just to ground this question, in an interview with TVO Executive Director of the uh, Disability Justice Network of Ontario or DJNO, Sarah Jemma stated that there is a distinction between accessibility goals and disability justice. And this is a quote, when people talk about accessibility, it's usually around how we build a world around this pre-existing society that fits people with disabilities. Disability justice involves building a society that's free and fits everybody. And so as we reflect on a way forward regarding accessibility within professional programs, what are some recommendations that you would make that are mindful and inclusive of BIPOC students with disabilities? Um, and so we'll start with you, Fatima. Uh, I know you've already made several recommendations um, and thank you for that. Are there any others that come to mind? Yeah, so um, like it came up in the previous question, representation really does matter. Like um, it's like disability is so isolating. Being a part of any minority group is so isolating and it literally actually, it does like just compound you. There's always like, for me, I felt like there's always a part that I cannot speak about to one person. Like it's always either speaking about one thing or the other, and it just never encapsulates everything. Um, and for me, that was when I was trying to find support and figure out what was going down or what was going on. Um, but I know for a lot of people that also happens in other levels, such as when meeting, if you're meeting with someone and you're trying to explain that you have these issues, if your accessibility advisor is not that, or not experienced with your experiences specifically, or they don't, or they're not able to speak to properly, my accessibility advisor is an icon, and I love her, but, um, like, finding support was so hard for me, because I was just, like, I was, like, drowning, to be honest with you, and it was, like, there was no, nothing to connect to, to pull me back to the surface. It was, like, what is going on. When you see people who go through stuff um, similar to you, you see experiences similar to yours being brought to the forefront, being spoken about. Um, 
not being shoved in your face, but in a place that's like unmistakable to see, like it's not being hidden, you don't have to go and find it, um, is actually unironically life-changing. And I think, yeah, just being mindful of representation and making sure that, you know, and this is really where being a person of color came into play, uh, making sure that people in these support situations have experience with students who have different experiences than them, knowing how to speak to that and kind of being able to look at their issues or look at what's happening with them and not have to probe further to someone who's already in a sort of critical time period, I think would be very useful, you know, if, you, if that makes sense. Um, but apart from that, um, engineering in the first year, we learned about universal design. You know, it's about, it's really about making a framework that, like the quote that was said, um, creates a great foundation that works for everyone rather than trying to fill in gaps later. Like if you just make a tank out of a good material, you don't have to plug in the holes and the leaks afterwards. And then that way it's still a functional tank. Sure, it takes a little bit of extra work, but you know, it's all about making the best that you can make for everyone to have a good experience. Thank you, Fatima. Um, love the very engineering example you gave there of the tank. <laughs> so uh, we just have a, a quick minute. Um, Lauren, over to you and then over to you, Olivia. Yeah, thank you. Um, I totally, I'm going to just echo everything that was said. I really think that accessibility should be like in the forefront. It should not be an afterthought. It shouldn't be that, um, you know, all the students come in together and then if you need something, go here. It should just be that everything is already offered at the front and then students who would like to take it are able to take it. Um, you know, just a quick little story that I say all the time. It's kind of just like an anecdote of kind of how this can all work. We're thinking of like a school, right, that has 19 students um, and one of them is in a wheelchair, the other 19 are not. Um, one day it's while they're outside playing recess, um, it starts to snow and it just completely covers the ramp and the stairs. And the janitor goes out and starts to shovel the snow off of the stairs. And um, when the student in the wheelchair goes up to the janitor and asks if he's able to shovel the ramp, he says, well, I will shovel the ramp, but I want to make sure that we shovel the stairs first because um, there are more students that need the stairs, but we'll make sure that we shovel the ramp for you afterwards. And then the student in the wheelchair can just say, well, if you shovel the ramp, all 20 of us can go up the ramp, right? So if we think of it in that way, um, making sure that the program is already accessible for everyone is easier than just catering to the 19 and then adding the additional. And it also is better and more equitable to make sure that everybody is just has their needs met right at the start. Thank you, Lauren. I love that example and I appreciate you sharing it with us. Olivia. Yeah, for me, I would say I would also echo what Fatima and Lauren have said. And I would say, um, particularly when it comes to offering programs for Black students, I would recommend just being very careful about the language that's used because Black students don't want to be seen as uh, that they're being given privileges that they haven't earned. And so as long as it's an asset-based approach that looks at, um, you know, helping uh, Black students due to in inequities, um, you know, then students may want to access it. But if it's if it's not worded properly, then they might take offense to it, which I have <laughs> um, at times. So I would just say, be careful about the language that you use. And um, yeah, I would just challenge the rigidity of professional programs, uh, because I think uh, what it means to be professional needs to be broadened. Um, to include those with uh, disabilities. Thank you so much, uh, Olivia, and, and the asset-based uh, approach. I, I love that phrase. Um, the importance of really grounding the work in inequity versus inequality. So we want equal outcomes for folks, but we need to address the inequities. Um, and that's going to be the way to ensure that folks also don't feel like they're um, being given unearned privilege or 
really importantly, will be perceived as being granted voter privilege. So um, thank you so much to all the panelists. Uh, super appreciative of uh, everyone's input today. We have some time for questions. And so um, I'm going to, uh, I think, turn it over to Leah. Oh, I, will, uh, I see there's one uh, that's in the Q&A box. So uh, an anonymous attendee asked, uh, wondering if any of you had experience with universal design within your courses and how was that experience in regards to, um, did it minimize some of the worry around asking for accommodations or needing to disclose? And I'll, oh, Fatima, go ahead. Uh, so there's actually a really great example of this. Um, so in engineering, in the first year courses, we had like a bank, most of the classes had recorded lectures, but not all of them. And in since when pan, the pandemic started, there was pretty much every class had recorded lectures because people were in different time zones. And um, so what the first year, like, you know, with disability, my disability, at least, it's normal for me to miss class, um, miss classes. So in that case, where there's no recordings, trying and being a part of student council, where we were trying to see how did we see how difficult trying to get recordings is. And even after the pandemic ended, ended um, or not ended, but like engineering went in person last fall. So even seeing the difference between there be no longer being recordings available when you have recordings, you're just not giving them to the students. Um, and having to, you know, ask for that, literally see the difficulty that student council has trying to advocate for this. Um, whereas it was so easily given in the pandemic, I, I see the difference between like what being offered recorded lectures takes the pressure off me of having to push through and like struggle extra just to be able to go to class when I could have the same, a similar experience later, but in a more comfortable manner. And that's just like a very specific example, but you know, having these things readily available really does reduce the pressure put on oneself or even physical harm going to classes when you're not really at the best for it. Um, it definitely dismisses worry around asking for accommodations or need for disclosure. And if I can still speak, I don't know, I'm sorry. Um, when professors are really great about being emphatic about having accommodations available, really being on your side about that. Like at one point, one of my professors read through my accommodation letter better than I did and gave me an option for when I was really struggling. So, you know, like having professors be on your side or people in positions of power really be on your side about understanding that struggles exist and it doesn't make you a lesser person. It just means you have a different need and that's fine. It, it really is. A, you can feel the difference in a very positive way. Thank you, Fatima. Um, Olivia, do you uh, have any thoughts around experience with universal design? So uh, the only time I really encountered um, or looked into universal design was through uh, a special education course that I took. And so this was like, I was already, you know, in the program. It wasn't, you know, near the start of the program. And I feel like it should be like all students in every program should learn about this. Uh, because even for me, I never thought about the size of font that I was using, or if I was putting too much text on a slide. And I kind of learned those things kind of late in the program. So I would recommend that, you know, that should be something within all first year courses where you learn, if you're gonna do a slideshow, this is how you should do a slideshow. You should include this. If you're gonna do a presentation, this is what you should include because it wasn't until I kind of stumbled upon it in a later course that I learned about um, universal design. Thank you, Olivia. And Lauren? Um, in terms of like my learning, I haven't really come into contact with um, universal design, I guess, until the pandemic hit. And then a lot of things 
uh, had changed, as, as Fatima said, with, um, I, I did use a lot of uh, an undergraduate, I had notes for my classes that I could utilize from peer note takers. Um, we were advocating for like recordings of lectures, and it was up to um, like the prof if they felt as if they wanted to be recorded or not. But once the pandemic hit, and folks were unable to um, attend due to varying reasons, um, recordings were made accessible and everything like that so things did change and I think that's when um, things started to be a little bit more accessible for example um, uh, in my program we started our practicum in January and there were still some folks who were not in Toronto so they were able to access um, online like remote practicums um, and, because, and also some practicums were still online at that point due to the pandemic but before that in order to complete this program you had to be in Toronto and you had to be able to commute to school and you had to be able to commute to your practicum so there was a lot more physical need than there is now and um, the change for this wasn't um, for more of an accessibility in terms of disability, it was more for an accessibility in terms of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So kind of thinking of it, um, it is great that it has been implemented, but we also need to think about why it was implemented and if it will stay implemented um, post COVID and really advocate for that. Um, in terms of teaching, like um, as like a professional social worker and what we learn in terms of universal design, it really isn't taught in the core classes. It is something that you need to kind of seek out to learn. So for example, there is a um, health and disability justice class that you can take in social work, but it's an elective. And um, we do kind of speak about disability, but it's very, very minimal. And a lot of the times when we are speaking about um, theories and like practices to use with clients, a lot of it is centered um, in like kind of just like the like normativity mindset and disability is really disregarded in terms of that. So it is there, but you have to seek it out. And we also have to think about the social workers who are graduating from the program who may not have taken those courses versus the social workers who have taken those courses um, and, you know, stuff like that. Thank you, Lauren. A really important note about um, the kind of curriculum that is offered to professional program students and also who has to seek out what, um, what's the content about. And then what happens when you're in a profession where you're likely supporting folks who have disabilities uh, or family members or loved ones who have disabilities and you don't have the knowledge base uh, perhaps that one would hope a social worker has to do that integral work. Um, we have a couple more questions, so um, I'm going to do my best to uh, have folks answer them um, within the time we have. Um, perhaps, Olivia, if I might ask you this next question, what language would you encourage communicators use that doesn't imply an unearned privilege being granted? I'll repeat that. What language would you encourage communicators use that doesn't imply an unearned privilege being granted? Yeah, I would say using language that talks about making uh, space, safe spaces, I think is, is something that um, is not offensive because Black people, um, in my experience, under, um, well, I'd say for me, I understand that it's important to have safe spaces for, for Black people in particular. So I would say um, providing a safe space or, or just being explicit about, we understand that there is an inequity, therefore, dot, dot, dot. So kind of wording it that way, instead of saying like, um, like the example that I was kind of offended by was um, when they, it was shared that they were no longer doing this math course. And then they kind of at attached that to like racialized students. And I was like, it kind of implies that maybe black students have a hard time with math. So that's just an example of like how you, you have to be specific about like, why are you saying that this accommodation is being made? Are you saying because you wanna like provide equity or are you saying it in a way that makes it sound like we black people or people of color are less capable of certain things? 
So that's what I would say. Thank you, Olivia. And then we have a, a comment uh, and then a couple of questions. And so again, just maybe in the interest of time, Lauren, if I might tap you. Um, so this is a comment. I work as an accessibility officer at a mid-sized university. Uh, the panelists have spoken so well and provided a lot of insight. I find many students I work with are worried about discussing accommodations with their instructors, even when they're registered with formal accommodation. Um, often it's important that the student and instructor have a discussion about needs or options for a course, especially if the impact of disability is unpredictable and changing. What are your thoughts about this? What advice would you give to accessibility offices about teaching self-advocacy? I think self-advocacy is, is a big thing. And like as a peer advisor, like for accessibility services, I get a lot of students coming in and saying like, you know, I need this accommodation, but I have no idea how to ask. So kind of just thinking about self-advocacy, I think it could be a good start to kind of just take it a step back before the self-advocacy and make sure that the faculty and the staff are also just well informed on like exactly what accommodations are rather than just accessibility services or the office exists because I think I've had students um, who have come in and said that they've requested let's say a week extension and the prof has said I'll give you two days so it's like they obviously do not know what exactly is being expected of them and I think for them to be informed would be the perfect first step because it would make advocating for yourself a little bit better. Secondly, when I have students come in, I always tell them that like this accessibility is a right, you are not asking for it, you are informing, and to disclose as much as you would like. So when I tell students, I would say, you know, do it, you know, if you'd like via email, say, oh, this is exactly what I would like to disclose. Um, um, I need X, Y, and Z. Um, here is whatever form of proof that you have. For example, U of T has their accommodation letter and then kind of just hand it off. And then the third quick thing I would say is as an accessibility officer or accessibility advisor, anybody, just making sure that you have your students back because a lot of the time self-advocating, especially if you're taking five courses and you have five professors that you need to do that over and over again, can be exhausting, especially when they start to push back on you. Then you have five people pushing back on your experience of life. So it's really to make sure if you have that person who has authority, who is at the same level as the faculty kind of fighting for you in your corner, it really does make a difference for students who are already quite nervous to go against an authority figure asking for something. Thank you. Thank you so much um, to all of you for this incredibly rich panel discussion. Thank you so much, Reshma and Janelle, for um, your facilitation of this panel. And um, a big thank you to Lauren, Olivia, and Fatima for just sharing in such a vulnerable way and sharing such meaningful experiences and also providing us with some real tangible recommendations that we can, that can inform our work with students. This was really such a meaningful um, session and we really do thank you so much. We're gonna be breaking now for lunch, thanks. Hi everyone, so just as uh, Leah indicated, we are going to be breaking for lunch, so we will see you all back here at 12.30 p.m. And we're excited to welcome you back after a much needed refreshing lunch break. Bye for now. Hello, everyone.
Hello, everyone, and welcome to this session. Uh, this session is um, titled Accommodation, Academic Remediation, Learning Skills, and Stepping Out Slash Back into Academic Programs. My name is Reggie Wee. I am the team lead of the Accessible, Inclusive, and Experiential Learning Team here at Accessibility Services for the St. George campus. I will be moderating now through to the end of this session with Jamie Coleman and Irene Sullivan. To describe myself, I am a Southeast Asian man in my late 20s with straight black hair. My Zoom background is of a rainbow pride flag with black, brown, and trans chevrons. Um, I would kindly ask that the slides uh, be put up for this session. Thank you. I'd like to start off with an access check. We understand access to be a shared responsibility between everyone in this space. We will strive to create an accessible space that reduces the need for you to disclose a disability or impairment for the purposes of gaining an accommodation. In doing this together, we strive to welcome disability and the changes it brings into our space. Is there anything about the virtual space that we should address now? Are there any other access needs that might affect your participation in the workshop that we could also address? On the next slide, we will go over how you can submit a response to either of these two questions, as well as for the rest of the conference. Throughout the conference, all speakers will describe visual elements as best they can. We welcome participants to turn off their camera, get up and move around, and take as many breaks, take as many screen breaks as they need to throughout the conference. This slide shows a visual of the Zoom control at the bottom of your screen. Use the Q&A to submit questions for the presenters or if you experience any technical difficulties and require assistance. If you are unable to submit questions anonymously, sorry, you are able to submit questions anonymously. If you prefer to ask your question live, you can use the raise your hand feature and you will be asked to unmute yourself. For keyboard users, you can press Option and then Y on Mac, or Alt and then Y on Windows. For mouse users, select Participants, choose Raise Your Hand at the bottom of, your, of the panel. We respectfully request that you wait until the designated question period to ask any questions using either the Q&A or Raise Your Hand feature. Note that moderators may not be able to get up to all the questions. We are real-time captioning the entire conference. To enable text captioning, click on Live Transcript and select Show Subtitles. Text captioning is auto-enabled on mobile devices. We also have the sign language interpreting for the entire conference, which is available on laptop and desktop users. Please submit a question via the Q&A feature if you are experiencing any technical difficulties. I'd now like, like to introduce uh, our presenters for today. First is Irene Sullivan. Irene Sullivan is the neurological team lead at Accessibility Services at the University of Toronto and has over 27 years experience in neuropsychological assessment of neurological disabilities, including learning disabilities, ADHD, brain injury, ASD, MS, and HIV. Irene ran a head injury clinic for a Toronto trauma hospital and was the clinical manager of a multidisciplinary neurological disorders assessment clinic. Irene is active in community advocacy work for individuals with brain injury and ASD, and was a member of the panel that developed the Ontario Neurotrauma Guidelines for Concussion Management for Adults. We also have Jamie Coleman. Jamie is an assistant professor in the teaching stream in the Department of Physical Therapy at the University of Toronto. She is academic lead of the cardiorespiratory course, academic coordinator of clinical education, and graduate coordinator for the Master of Science Physical Therapy students. Jamie completed a Bachelor of Physical Education and Health and a Master of Science in Physical Therapy, both at the University of Toronto. She has also completed a Master of Health Management at McMaster University and holds the Certified Health Ex Executive CHE designation. I will now pass it over to Irene and Jamie. Thank you very much for that uh, introduction, Reggie. It's a pleasure to be here today to talk about this topic. 
Um, so first to describe myself. Uh, so I am a female olive skinned and I have brown hair that's pulled back into a half ponytail and I'm wearing a blue blazer and a gray shirt. So as Richie mentioned, I am the graduate coordinator in the physical therapy program and Irene is from Accessibility Services and we have collaborated together to support a number of students uh, with disabilities in their practicum placements. Um, so today we'll be using a case-based approach. So we have one complex case that we will be using to talk about our topic, uh, accommodations, academic remediation, learning skills, stepping out and back into academic programs. So next slide. And next slide again. So specifically at the end of this session, we hope that you will have a, an increased understanding about navigating interventions, accommodations, and supports when working with students with disabilities in a professional program. And some of the things that we're gonna to touch upon is examining collaborative approaches to identifying accessibility needs given program core competencies, identifying functional disability impacts and barriers to participation, identifying program step outs, planning for assessment, remediation, skill building, and accommodation, formulating a process for return to the program, and monitoring return and adjusting as necessary. So next slide. So we have a couple of polls and we'll just go ahead and launch the first one. So first we wanna get an idea of who is attending today. So we have a couple of options for you and we recognize that you might fall into several categories, but please select whichever option is most applicable to you. So the options are student, faculty member, course instructor, teaching assistant, um, accessibility, disability services professional, allied health professional, which includes OT, PT, speech, and others, um, physician, other student life, post-secondary, professional administrative, and community members. So we'll give you maybe another 30 seconds to complete the poll. And then perhaps we can go ahead and launch the results. Oh, or did we just put them up? Okay, <laughs> we'll just give you another 30 seconds. All right, if you could please close the poll and show the results. So uh, we have a number of different people. It uh, looks like we don't have any students here today, but we have um, you know, a number of faculty members or disability services professionals, some allied health and other post-secondary staff. Um, so we're gonna move on to our next slide. And if you could, launch the second poll. So we'd like to know whether you have worked with a student who has needed accommodations in a practicum setting due to disability impact. So the options are yes, no, or not sure. I'll just give you a few seconds to answer that. Okay, so we can close the poll and show the results. So uh, most of you have indicated yes, which is great. I think the case we're presenting today has a, a lot of a complexity. So hopefully you'll be able to compare that to some of your past experience and also it'll take away uh, some new information as well. And for those of you who aren't sure or haven't, then we have a lot of considerations and that you can take forth with you in the future as well. So we'll move on to the next slide. So before we jump into um, our case, I'd just like to provide a, a little bit of background information. So first is talking about the program essential requirements. So professional programs often have essential requirements that are listed in uh, and program components that are outlined in their handbooks or, or some of their program information. So what are essential program requirements? So these are outcomes including knowledge, skill, and attitudes that all students must demonstrate 
with or without using accommodations. So these essential requirements consist of both academic and practicum requirements. And it's important for both programs and um, accessibility services professionals to be familiar with these essential requirements. So these are important to identify barriers and to participate in the accommodations process. So we'll move to the next slide. And we have another poll, if you could go ahead and launch it. So for those teaching, working, or participating in a professional clinical training program, are you aware of written documents outlining essential skills in your program? So the options are, yes, there are essential skills documents. No, there are no official essential skills documents. And uh, the third option is, I have not heard of these types of documents. What are they? So we'll give you just a few more seconds to vote. And then if you could close the poll and show the results. So we have a, a mixture where most people said, yes, there are essential skills documents. And that's fantastic that you um, are aware of these documents. It's always helpful to pull them out and have a, a quick review. Uh, some of you don't have any official skills documents and, and hopefully or potentially this might be an opportunity to create some. And uh, in the next slide, we'll talk a little bit more about what these documents entail. So we can move on to the next slide. So as I mentioned, essential requirements are the outcomes that all students must demonstrate. And often these include, we have uh, eight, uh, about seven categories here. There may be others, but I think most fall into these eight or seven categories. So the first one um, is the essential academic and non-academic abilities in the areas of intellectual, conceptual, integrative, and quantitative abilities. And in physical th therapy, we actually have a couple of documents. We have an essential attributes documents, and this is available for all students in Ontario who are applying to a PT program. So they can read this document even prior to being accepted to determine if they are su suitable. And I know um, OT and SLP also have these documents and, and other programs may as well. So an example of um, an intellectual conceptual component. So in, in our document, it says cognitive and memory to measure, calculate and reason to analyze, integrate and synthesize information. So in the profession, we're having to take in a lot of different information and analyze, synthesize that to um, make clinical decisions and provide a rationale. The second category is observational skills. So for example, in our document, it says gathering information through visual, auditory, and tactile information. So again, gathering skills through multiple sensory inputs. Um, we also have physical abilities, which is our third category. So an example of that is must be able to physically participate in labs and practicums, and in physical therapy in particular. There's lifting um, requirements, there's stamina requirements. Um, so providing lifts and transfers to patients, lifting equipment. Uh, the fourth category is motor functioning. So that is being able to use instruments um, to complete assessment and treatment. So for example, most professions use a stethoscope uh, in physical therapy. We use other things like a, a goniometer or different electrical physical agents. So um, students must be able to operate these devices uh, in an adaptive or in the standard way. The fifth is emotional stability. So for example, our document says demonstrate resilience, resiliency to function under stress and balance emotionally charged or ethically charged situations and still be able to manage in those situations. And then the sixth category is behavioral or social skills. So for example, demonstrating sensitivity, compassion, uh, integrity, and concern for others. And you know, all professional programs and all programs have ethics and professionalism requirements that students must be aware of and be able to act in that way. So we'll move on to the next slide. So in the slide, we uh, have a brief information on the accommodations process. We have a, a wheel on the slide 
that has uh, different colors that sort of represents the accommodations process. I will note that each university and organization might have a slightly different um, process depending on their structure and organization, but I think the general steps um, are the same. It just might vary who, who is involved in the steps. So first is, you know, determining the essential uh, requirements of the program. Uh, it's working with the student to get appropriate documentation, to um, develop an accommodation plan, then implementing the accommodation plan and um, monitoring and evaluating it. But I think the key thing that we would like you to take away from this slide is that this is a collaborative process. And I have a, a Venn diagram here that has uh, the overlapping collab to represent the collaboration between the student, the program and the accessibility services. So it's really a collaborative process and it's also dynamic. So this doesn't happen at one point in time, but we are collaborating together throughout the full students program uh, and touching base at multiple points uh, when needed and, and just to check in. So we'll move to the next slide. So now that we have provided a little bit of background information, we'd like to introduce you to our case. And uh, the, the student's name is Hannah. And I will note this is a compilation of many different students that uh, Irene and I have seen in the past and it is not um, based on a real person <laughs> named Hannah, but, but it's just a case uh, for the purpose of this presentation. So Hannah is a first year physiotherapy student um, so she just started in the program and she's completing her academic coursework and her first full-time practicum is approaching. So she approaches the uh, program to let them know that she has sustained a concussion and as a result of some of the symptoms she's experienced, she's requested to have extra time on tests and to complete uh, the pra her practicum, her upcoming placement part-time. So the professors also observe that she's missing classes, she appears fatigued, and she's sitting on a stool during labs, um, you know, to balance her uh, fatigue and her stamina. Um, and now I'll pass it along to Irene. So next slide, please. Thank you. Um, and I'll just uh, uh, describe myself. Uh, my, I am a Caucasian female um, in my 60s. Um, and today I am wearing a periwinkle shirt with a black cardigan and my background is mostly off-white but in the far background are a couple of small uh, Lauren Harris prints that are mostly blue and brown. Um, also I'll just let you know that many of our slides are mostly word content but there is also an image to represent and a box that speaks to different points uh, uh, of intersection with comments and things going on for Hannah so we'll mention that as we go along. So what I'm going to talk about here is uh, sort of what happens in a, a student coming to register with our service and sort of really a start of an accommodation process. Uh, and I'd just like to say overall, and we'll describe this throughout, that it's a very dynamic process. This isn't a one-time uh, process that is set up. It is something um, in our collaborations with programs and as, as student moves through programs, will change several times. So students uh, come to register with us in lots of different ways. They may um, be requesting accommodations directly to a program and be directed to us uh, as uh, the sort of official office to go to. They may also read about it in a course, uh, in a course orientation materials they receive or in an orientation offered by their program or a general orientation at the university. They may also register in working with their own health professionals in the community who suggested that this would be a good um, office to connect with when they're uh, involved in post-secondary studies. The other times, another time that students often connect is sometimes students have had accommodations through earlier uh, education, whether it be elementary, high school, or an undergraduate degree. And so it's a natural continuation to register as they enter a program. But lots of students who've had um, uh, disability related challenges have managed them either with strategies they've learned or um, just uh, uh, learning skills that work for them and have not needed to register in a more traditional undergraduate program. But as they enter a program, a professional program uh, or a clinical practice program, it may be the first time in which they will seek formal accommodations because of the format of the programming is changing and there's this practical clinical component now that may not have ever been present before, which may um, lead to some concerns for them or wondering about how accommodations might work in those programs. 
So it really starts with the student completing, in our office at least, an, an online registration program. They can also, if they need supports, receive in-person help to complete that application as well. And on their form, they indicate the impacts from their perspective, their own sense of impacts, as well as providing us with whatever disability medical documentation they will have from their healthcare provider or healthcare team. So in this particular case, Hannah submitted, uh, filled in our online form, and she also submitted doc documentation from her family doctor that indicated she had a concussion. Uh, next slide, please. So what we would do once we've received this online form and the documentation, uh, this is our starting point. Uh, documentation can look very similar for many students, but the intersection between impacts uh, are, are very different for students. I've seen many times uh, documentation almost looks identical, but how it impacts a student depends on a lot of things, the experiences they've had to date, uh, the program they're going to enter, and how they, uh, how they view their disability impacts and what has been helpful to them. So the intake process is really, an uh, intake interview, sorry, is a really an opportunity for the uh, accessible advisor to sit down with the student and ask a lot of questions and gather a lot of information from the student who has the lived experience. And so there's a number of components to that. So we do ask lots of questions around academic skills, um, both strengths and weaknesses. We're not just trying to identify areas of weakness, but we also want to know where those strengths are. Because we're going to use that to think about accommodations that will be helpful, and also for potential skill building opportunities that may be available that a student may not have been uh, exposed to before or ever needed before. Um, so this is going to help us understand how a person learns. And we're going to do a really retrospective look as well as what has worked and what has not. I think students are best at informing us what has worked for them and what has not worked for them. And it's a good starting point to gather that information, not just about what they need to learn now, but what has worked in the past and what has, has, has created challenge. Um, so for in asking some of those questions for Hannah, Hannah identified that since this what seemed to be a temporary disability, um, she was experiencing difficulty with reading. And you need to delve into that. She was seeing words fine, wasn't a problem with actually seeing the word, but she was finding it just took her longer to read. Everything seemed to be going slower. She described it as almost like going through mud. It's a very slow process. And then she found that even after she read, she wasn't really comprehending and was rereading several times to grasp the meaning, especially in this new material she was learning in her new program. She was also having difficulty finding words, expressing herself, and finding a slowness to get ideas together. So her program being very interactive, uh, both in class and in uh, labs, it was challenging because she just couldn't generate quick information to participate in a timely manner. Um, was very frustrated by that and also a little bit worried about how she was viewed um, in terms of her uh, struggling to participate uh, like other students were. She was also finding it hard to learn new material. She was spending extensive hours trying to study new terms, read over readings, trying to memorize. And she was really worried about how she was going to prepare for tests um, and how she was going to write them and recall information. She also was presenting with sensitivity to prolonged computer screen work. And we really need to delve in that because there's a lot of things. I think everybody in the past couple of years have found all the computer work we've had to do taxing. Um, we're not used to being on computers this long. But when you have a concussion, it may be from a number of things. It could be light sensitivity. It could also be um, uh, reacting to the refreshing and flickering going on uh, behind the scene and screen. So really important to understand what, uh, what they were sensitive to and how long it took before they felt sensitive or felt they had to take a break. Um, especially that's been extremely important in lots of programs in the last two years where everything has been online. Um, she also reported afternoon fatigue and also difficulty getting up in the morning and even though she'd slept not feeling rested so starting the day somewhat tired and just parceling out what that fatigue was about there was a physical component she just felt dizzy she felt generally unwell um, just walking a lot and getting to campus um, traveling to campus was tiring her out and walking around a lab but also a cognitive fatigue that just drained her by mid-afternoon uh, next slide please I just want to mention that too. I think it was really important takeaway from the student panel this morning about uh, two of the students there mentioned about how um, the buildup effect of trying to keep up with their program and their practicum and that fatigue. So maybe handling it fine during the day, being exhausted in the evening or by the end of the week being exhausted. So that kind of hidden disability impact. So talking about fatigue and what it means is important and becomes more important. You'll see when we talk about 
uh, how you set up a, a practicum for somebody uh, when they have this kind of ongoing fatigue. So sometimes you have a student who's able to do everything in a class and it looks like they're well prepared, but they spend triple the time another student has to manage that and, and sort of not doing anything else in their lives other than trying to manage academic uh, skills, uh, academic tasks. So the other thing that we often talk about in intake meetings, which I think is so important, is other health issues, supports that a student has, and other aspects of their life that may be impacting academics. So much is going on in lives that is not about academics, um, but very much impacts it. Um, for this student, she was, uh, for financial reasons, uh, living farther from campus to, to be able to afford it, so traveling quite a bit, and also had varying uh, social supports as well. Um, also, too, uh, we find sometimes when the student has to slow down, they, they kind of go out of their cohort, so they're not with unfamiliar people in terms of supports and uh, uh, other students in their program. So uh, Hannah was reporting that in her review, she, she'd she been successful in previous attempts. Uh, she'd been a, a very strong student, she had needed supports, um, and she had done very well, especially in traditional kinds of programs where it was like a lecture, you had to either write a paper or write a test or exam, and those were the ways you were evaluated. She had no difficulties, according to her, for in communication in the past, and felt that she was good at socially communicating and communicating in academic settings. And she also reported no difficulty learning materials in the past. She felt like she was a solidly uh, high average student who did well and really didn't struggle learning material, um, which also attests that she had done well enough to be admitted into this physiotherapy program, which is quite competitive. She did not report any challenges in the past with working computers, but we also learned that she hadn't really, she wasn't really super computer savvy. So using adaptive tech was not something she'd ever tried. Um, and that was an important consideration to think about when coming up with accommodations. She reported that also, which was important to discover, was that she'd had four previous concussions. Um, she'd had some brief steps out of school, like a week or two in high school, but nothing that was lasting and a couple informal accommodations around um, handing an assignment a little bit later. But it was important to understand because it's part of what led to this concussion not being so temporary um, and, and having a much more lasting effect. Uh, next slide, please. So all of this information, along with documentation, uh, gets gathered in, into kind of a picture um, uh, so that we can start thinking about accommodations and working with the program and the student to figure out what accommodation is going to work for them. So we gather a lot of information uh, through their learning history and other documents and understand, of course, we have a concussion here entering in the fall term, which is initially more academic, sort of more traditional academics that the four concussions we knew from sort of working with advisor who knew more about this area might have a longer impact. So thinking about what this might mean for the student and how this might be managed in conjunction with documents we were getting from her healthcare providers and how this, how this delayed recovery she was experienced might be very a complicating factor in a program that was very high paced and high demand. Um, how, even for a student who has a brief concussion in a program that moves quickly, it can be quite difficult to figure out how you can accommodate and keep up and manage. Um, and just keep in mind that this was also, she didn't have an academic history of Trump sort of having these challenges and what that was going to mean for her in her coping and supports that she would need as she was going through very new experiences here and also in a new program. Um, so at this point, she was just in um, sort of more academic classes and um, accommodations were around having extra time for tests and opportunities to take breaks and some extended time for assignment completion, as well as being allowed to use um, a stool to sit in labs uh, just to help manage fatigue as well. But right from the beginning in this meeting, uh, it was something that we talked about, started hinting about practicum accommodations and thinking about it just in a broad way that we might want to think as we go along, as she experienced things, where are we going to need to plan for practical accommodations? This same comment was made to a program, so they would have a sense that we may be looking to student who may need um, a, a little more setup to be in a practical situation. Uh, next slide, please. I'll turn the first part to you, Jamie. So when we're talking about um, practicum placement uh, planning, um, the program and accessibility services 
sometimes have two different perspectives. We, we are all both uh, going um, in the same direction. We want the same things, but sometimes we come out of, um, out of it from a different perspective. So on this slide, we have two columns that outline some of the program's major perspectives and accessibility services major perspectives. So we'll talk a little bit about the program. So we are concerned with the student's ability to meet program essential requirements. So uh, with accommodations, um, we welcome accommodations to help students meet the program requirements, but we're also looking at those accommodations to make sure they're not lowering the bar and that they still allow the students to meet those requirements. Uh, patient and student safety is definitely a concern. So we're concerned with students and, you know, we're going into a place and actually in Hannah's case, potentially delay her concussion recovery and have um, lasting impacts moving forward in the program. Um, and if it's you know more of a long-standing disability, what's the impact of that disability for the student in the practicum environment? There's also the patient's perspective. We want to ensure patient safety and there's many considerations there. So there's the cognitive aspect of, of determining potential safety risks and having a plan to manage those. And then there's the physical requirements, having the stamina and the strength to support patients. So in physical therapy, we're requiring transfer. So we might be assessing balance that requires um, us to um, you know, put our hands on or support the student uh, or the patient so that there's not a fall. So you need to have the stamina and the physical ability to do that. Also the available placement. So we don't have a standard set of placements for each practicum time period. They're different in each time period. So uh, we might be considering the pace of the setting, the supervisory level, the patient conditions to try to match a suitable placement for um, that student. Um, and then the accessibility services um, considerations. Yes, so again, uh, again, we're gonna, it is a collaborative process. Uh, given the nature of this kind of disability where there's changes going on all the time, it's been very helpful to uh, work with the health practitioners that were involved to get frequent kind of updates. Um, concussion changes a great deal, um, how it displays itself and some symptoms disappear, some symptoms last longer um, and very unique to each individual um, person who has a concussion. So setting up uh, sort of ongoing contact with the health care provider to help guide us and to, we had to seek Sort of documentation updates more frequently to kind of get a current picture because the picture was changing quite a bit. Um, and we want to consider what accommodations can we put in place that reduce or eliminate impacts, but also keep in mind as we work to pour, uh, towards practical accommodations that client care cannot be interfered with and we need to make sure that we're not creating any um, risks for either the students or clients in the settings that they will be having their practicums. And then really having a student who has a lot of strong skills, how can we use those in compensatory strategies? How can we use that to key match that with accommodations um, that will draw on strengths um, and allow the student to demonstrate their knowledge? Next. Um, so in terms of internship considerations, when we're thinking about a placement setting, there's, we have um, six things on the slide that you might consider in trying to um, match a student with accommodations to an appropriate setting. So first is the physical demands. So that includes exertion, stamina, lifting, hours, uh, and the need to travel to and within the site. So I think that travel time is um, very important. So you know, just, we all know, you know, commuting can be exhausting for all of us and we need to factor that in. We don't want the student to spend their time and energy commuting when, and then not have anything left for the placement. Uh, if we think about physical demands, they vary by setting. So in acute care hospital, for example, you're walking around the entire hospital. The patients are more dependent. There's more lifting needs versus, you know, a clinic where there might be, you know, the, the lifting is moving a limb through space or some equipment, but there's a different physical demand there. The second is the cognitive demand. So reading, attention, memory, calculations, problem solving. So if we compare a setting that has more routine patients, they're coming in with the same diagnosis, a similar treatment plan versus other settings where the patients are complex, they're, they're, they're new conditions, they're ambiguous, and there's the more problem solving and cognitive aspect that's needed. Um, there's the communication requirements. So 
that includes tactful, sensitive communication. So you can think about, you know, working on a cancer ward where there's people that have received potentially bad news and um, working with them in that situation. Um, there's the oral communication ability to communicate ideas, and this can vary or be more challenging in settings like pediatrics or working with patients with dementia. Um, students have to generate questions. Uh, they might have to have quick follow-up communication that doesn't require that processing time with their supervisor or coworkers or patients. Uh, the fourth category is administrative requirements. So consideration of record generating, writing, and precise record keeping. So for example, some of the insurance industri industries or workplace industries uh, require very detailed long reports uh, that can you know, have a whole other skill. There's also a variation in electronic medical records from um, you know, computer-based that require check boxes or radio buttons to writing with pen and paper and having to record everything. And that requires a different level of administrative requirement. So the fifth is the level of interprofessional collaboration, which can vary among settings. So in some like, clinic settings, it might be more email or telephone collaboration versus more of a hospital or rehab setting, which requires you know, collaborating to provide care, to develop treatment plans, presenting at rounds, sometimes treatment plans can have a different perspective. So there's some conflict management there that has to happen. And self-assessment and feedback is an important in all settings, but depending on the setting, there might be you know, more opportunities for that processing time or more opportunities to fit in that feedback discussion. So we'll go to the next slide. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about different areas of uh, practical accommodations, different potential aspects of it. And, and I'd like to draw a bit on uh, our student panel this morning and some of the comments they made around how we can kind of, uh, what their experience was and how to improve sort of um, receptiveness to practical accommodations and just making students aware that accommodation processes are available. And uh, just to combine sort of, come, I was thinking in mind about combining a couple thoughts that Fatima and uh, Olivia also said around um, expect disability to be in the room. And also the concepts around capability is in the room. I, I really want to make it clear that all these students have met the requirements to be in this program. Um, they may learn differently. We may need to look at how they deliver essential requirements and essential learning. But part of that planning is to plan ahead for practicums. Often we're uh, sometimes thinking about practicum that's coming up in a short few weeks, but sometimes the practicum planning has to happen even earlier when choosing the practicum. Um, and that just touches is on sort of what Lauren was saying in her experience of looking through that long list of placements and trying to figure out what 10 do I pick um, and the detail information that was provided or well, how, how little there might be in some cases. So when I talk about these kind of accommodations, I think this is something that people who might design essential skills or outline descriptions of um, practicums might think about in the descriptions they can provide to students up front of what is possible. It doesn't mean that because they indicate a particular accommodation hasn't um, uh, been made available so far, but have they thought about it um, and in describing what their setting looks like? So I think that would help students incredibly pick out um, a better practicum for them, or if they're really interested in practicum, uh, bringing to their accessibility advisor and practicum and the practicum coordinator um, uh, uh, some information about a thing. I'd really like this to be one of my settings. However, they're saying, um, you know, they can do something a certain way. Is there any flexibility there? So that the matches can be better up front. There are times when we do need to take students out of these sort of kind of automated matches because the needs are such that we need to really think uh, and plan far in ahead for a placement setting um, and, and sometimes even look for an additional placement setting than has been available on the list. So just some things to keep in mind. Um, so this mentions a uh, few different types of practical accommodations, setting accommodations, administrative accommodations, feedback and monitoring accommodations, and technology accommodations. In a moment, I'm gonna go into um, them in more detail. Uh, next slide, please. So setting accommodations. So this again is, uh, Jamie touched on this a little bit uh, just previously, but just uh, these are accommodations that might affect where the placement's going to be at all. Not, never mind what's gonna happen when you're in the placement, but what's gonna happen about the placement. So setting accommodations, the geographic location, is what's the proximity to student? Does the student, for example, as in the case of Hannah, have significant fatigue issues and we want to make sure the student is not traveling for a large period of time before 
and arriving already quite fatigued and spent before they even start their practicum day? Are there transportation considerations? Are some forms of transportation not available to a particular practicum that need to be used by someone due to disability impacts? Uh, for example, having to try, go in certain kinds of public transit with a concussion can be absolutely uncomfortable. Uh, another student, say on the spectrum, would find, might find going on the bus to get some place quite challenging. Um, and also just to keep those things in mind. So that might define where a, a, a practicum might be. How busy is the setting? Again, Jamie mentioned about acute care. An acute care setting or an, uh, a fracture clinic, which sees hundreds of people a day, might be too busy a setting given certain disability impacts versus maybe a community setting where uh, the client uh, flow is a little bit more spread out. Uh, the setting is not so busy around. Uh, there's not a giant examination room with the number of people being examined like you might see in a fracture clinic, to give an example or in an acute care setting in an IC unit where you're doing some basic physiotherapy care and there's several beds and several people doing all kinds of actions. Um, space, uh, we often don't think about the space piece and it's not just uh, to, it's maybe to carry out patient care activities if you're using any kind of tools to manage disability that take up space uh, or need a surface to place on. What does the space look like that the person will be working in? Um, also, um, and that might have, uh, you know, that could be for a lot of disabilities. Administrative tasks, some students who have uh, practical accommodations might need a quiet place to do charting. They might need a, a discreet place to use software where they have to speak aloud. Um, are those things available in the setting or can they be made available if people plan ahead? Can they find a space for that, um, for those kinds of things? Um, or if to manage disability, a student needs to step out to do something. Um, for in this case, maybe perform, uh, in Hannah's case, maybe to do some exercises, to lay down for a little bit, to be refreshed. Are those things possible in a setting? And then the work schedule. How are clients scheduled? Are they back to back? Do you have time to chart in between or do you chart at the end of the day? Is it, round, is it rounds early in the morning? Um, how late can you start in the day? What hours are your, your practicum supervisor going to be on site? Um, do you have to, where do you have to go? Do you have to travel to several buildings and get there in some kind of speed to, to perform the practicum? And what time, and can you do reduced hours uh, in that setting, maybe spread out over a longer uh, number of weeks, for example, to complete the practicum required hours? Uh, next one. Administrative accommodations, it's kind of a broad category, but um, looking at what's possible, sometimes students have, uh, due to disability impacts, may have trouble holding on to information, all the charting information they're going to have to do. So are, is there ability to alternate clients and tasks? Can they have a client block and then a charting block? Can they have a client block and then a break? Uh, what's possible in the setting? There are some settings where the, the, the patient flow is so high and needs to be that high. For example, a fracture clinic where lots of people in the hospital might be coming through a day, they all need to get through. Is that a good setting uh, or, or, or is there some way to redesign the setting so there's breaks? Record keeping, what kind of charting do they do in a center? Someone, so in this student's case, for example, being put in a place where all the charting is electronic was a challenge because it required a lot of computer work. So what is possible? Or is it handwritten charting? Is it charting in a binder where you can take your page out and work on? Or are you working on a continuous note um, and have to get your note in between the social worker and the occupational therapist? Uh, are templates used in the setting and you have to follow a particular template? Um, and can the workplace be customized? Is there space for ergonomic equipment or other adaptive equipment a, a student might need? Um, preparing for clients. Uh, is there ta extra time to prepare for chart reviews? Can there be some flexibility if a student takes a little longer to kind of get oriented for the day um, and prepare forms, for example? And assessment tools, can they, are there ways that they can use templates or tools to do assessments or are they, or are they on the run throughout the whole day just carrying a small notepad? Um, what is possible in terms of that record, record keeping flexibility? Next slide, please. Feedback accommodations. This is a challenging one because it's uh, obviously practicum supervisors provide feedback to students. And, uh, but uh, there's a lots of challenges that can impact with disabilities, different disabilities around communication, memory, attention, and fatigue can affect how we take in feedback. Also nonverbal issues around taking in feedback. Um, so just not grasping that maybe someone's not so happy with the way you did something or is a little bit irked about how long you're taking somewhere or a client is upset and you're not reading it. Uh, harking back to Jamie, Jamie's comment about the cancer patient who's upset and 
And if the student is not super sensitive to that kind of communication, how can they elicit and understand where this, the patient is at? So um, we talk about different accommodations around feedback. How, what's the frequency of feedback? Some people will need feedback, um, works best for them if it's in between clients. Sometimes it's by the day or can be by the week. Is it in person? Is it virtual? Um, is there follow-up in writing? Um, especially if they need to know, have trouble drawing what the main takeaways are from the feedback. So like I give you lots of feedback, what do I need to take from this? Sometimes virtual synthesizing that. So understanding how feedback will work best, which will help the supervisor too, because sometimes the supervisor is providing information, assuming the student is taking it all away, and then it's kind of has a challenges understanding what the student has been followed through. Um, and then also just using feedback charts, which is a much more visual way of providing feedback where a student actually walks away with something that explains where um, they need to do some work or what else the next steps are. And then also self-evaluation tools and maybe an opportunity. Do they need someone to work outside with them outside the placement uh, who provides some coaching on how things are going and some takeaways to work on, on in between placements day or in conjunction with their practical periods. Next slide, please. Sorry. So this next one is a little bit of a poll uh, and there might be multiple answers. I just wanted you to pick the one you're most drawn to. So if you can launch the poll. Which of these adaptations may be challenging or have implications for patient care specifically? Use speech to text software to make charting notes in the patient records. Use of a digital recorder to record the patient and student meetings. Use of a computer during client interviews to collect notes and use of an iPad as a camera to record or document client meetings. And we'll leave it up for a little bit of seconds here. They're a bit longer to read. Can you close the poll and put up the results, please? Yeah, so a variety of answers here. So there, yeah, and there's a lot of different angles of this in terms of how technology, of course, offers us a lot of advantages um, in uh, to for accommodations. But there are client. This is where in practicums and clinical practice we have to think about the implications for confidentiality, privacy, um, and uh, record keeping. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about how we get around some of these. But using speech to text software is one that we can use for charting sometimes. Uh, which is really helpful for students who may have difficulty with um, a learning disability or difficulty with handwriting um, where they can dictate their note. It also offers some ability for some spelling corrections and grammar corrections, which may help them make a more clear note. It also allows you sometimes to make the note on the run rather than having to get back to a big charting room you can stop in a space and maybe make a confidential note. Uh, using a digital recorder, of course, can create challenges. We sometimes can't get in those situations of using it, but how do we uh, deal with the privacy aspects and where is the digital recording device? Um, and same with using of the computer uh, for interviews. Sometimes we are more and more seeing things like iPads being used to record information in medical settings, but how do we ensure the privacy of that information? So working through those pieces of an accommodation, it's one part to recommend an accommodation, but how are we gonna work through those privacy pieces and security pieces that are necessary for client care, but at the same time providing that accommodation support. And the same with the iPad. Um, so can we just close that page now, please? Um, and then next slide, please. But just to talk a bit more about technology accommodations, uh, uh, often using things like templates to help a student who may have trouble organizing and making sure they're covering all parts in uh, different aspects of clinical care. So this may become in, uh, come into play in settings where they're doing assessments, like intake assessments, uh, therapies, uh, assessments to design therapy. It may also come in play in doing discharge notes as well, or uh, a follow-up note. So we often devise templates where a student actually has a, a sheet uh, or it could be on a computer screen um, that uh, like an iPad that they're using that has boxes with all the areas for that particular type of assessment they will use. And the student can put jot down notes or, or record notes into the different boxes. And then when they go to chart, they have this kind of framework of the areas they had to cover. But it also serves that section, second uh, function of if a space is still empty, 
it's a prompt that they've not asked about an area and that it will cue to ask. So it's really helpful in a lot of settings and a lot of people use them. And you just need to design the templates for the particular setting. Um, and we might do that with a learning strategist or an outside coach um, to help with those details and in conjunction with the program to make sure that uh, it meets uh, what, uh, uh, what they need to learn about. So we're making sure we're helping the student to, uh, uh, demonstrate the right things and gather the right kind of information, especially if a student's already being given some feedback that they're missing elements in, in what they're doing. Templates can be helpful. Voice to text software, very, very helpful um, in terms of being able to get information down. And the great part is Dragon Naturally Speaking, for example, is one software has a professional version that can recognize, it's a Dragon Medical basically recognizes a lot of the professional terms, very helpful if you have a uh, learning disability sort of in spelling, reading areas, it can help uh, predict words and spell things correctly, which is really important and accurate charting as well. Um, and also does a bit of word prediction to some degree, which can be helpful if you have trouble generating that. Also things like adaptive keyboards, screen sensitivity tools, there are all kinds of different screens we use, gray white screens um, to help manage uh, sensitivity and they can easily be added in a placement setting or some placements may already have those tools that they use with their own employees as well. And turn it back over to you, Jane. So next slide. Thanks, Irene. So in terms of uh, back to Hannah's case, so these were some of the practicum accommodations that um, that accessibility services and the student and the program um, determined that you know would be helpful for Hannah and for feasible. So a, a close practicum, so within 45 minute uh, commute of her home. And again, this is to reserve energy related to Hannah's fatigue. That was so much of a concern for her. Uh, reduce daily hours with practicum week. So instead of doing you know, seven and a half, eight hour placements, we reduced it to five or six hours. Um, and back to the essential requirements, often placements have a specific hour requirement and, and a program has a total hour requirement. So the implication of this was to either extend the placement weeks, or in this case, because we're a lock sector step program and we didn't have the opportunity to do that, we move those hours into a future placement period. Um, as Irene mentioned, alternate patient care blocks and administrative blocks uh, for fatigue management and record keeping. A, a slower rate of an increased patient load. So students usually have a specific pace, uh, caseload requirement that they need to meet. So in Hannah's case, it would have been a third to a half of a caseload uh, for her first placement. So just the accommodation for her to achieve that patient load later in the placement. And the use of templates for patient care information and daily feedback were also accommodations. Um, I will note that I feel these two accommodations are benefits for all students rather than what they have accommodations or not. But I think the purpose of putting these in an accommodation plan is for that skill building, which will Irene will talk about more in the in later on in the presentation. And as a program, we met with Hannah to talk through some of the placement options so we could, you know, guide her and advise her about what placements might be best for her at this stage. So next slide. So Hannah um, completes her first practicum experience and she did so successfully and met the requirements as she's entering the second year of the program. And this is a two year program. So she's entering into her final year. Um, they have a small summer three-week vacation, and unfortunately, during this vacation, Hannah falls off her bicycle. So it may have been related to ongoing high-level vestibular symptoms, or, you know, could have just been a fall off her, off her bicycle that uh, many of us may have had happen to us in the past. So uh, unfortunately, Hannah reported significant resurgence of her concussion symptoms, which were actually quite mild prior to this fall, and she was recovering well, and unfortunately had some new onset hip and back pain. So this is uh, what she reports to the program. So next slide. So with these new symptoms, um, you know, there was a concern about whether Hannah could continue in the program. So on this slide, we have two columns the program uh, considerations and the accessibility service considerations for a student taking a stop out or a leave of absence in the program. So from a program perspective, I, I think you've heard this many times already, but it's again that ability to meet the essential requirements. Does she have the physical and cognitive stamina right now with her new symptoms to meet these requirements? And what is the impact of those 
Uh, often we're thinking about the long term, uh, both the short term and long term. Is she able to continue learning and retaining content and skills that will allow her to build the skill set um, in uh, throughout the program? It, there's also client safety and effective care provision. So we need to make sure that the client safety and care provision is um, available, that she's able to do that. From an accessibility services perspective, there needs to be updated accommodations, um, uh, documentation about the accommodations and how the new uh, symptoms are impacting her ability to, um, her, her new symptoms are impacting her functional ability. And she's working with the student to review competencies and inter, uh, current impacts of the disabilities. And accessibility services is in a really great position to do that because they have more documentation than the program does and more information about the disability and the impacts. Um, and, you know, knowing that the accommodations cannot interfere with the essential competencies. And I think it's important to note that these conversations are difficult to have with students. Um, so, you know, they often have an idea of what they want to accomplish in their life and the timeline. So they want to finish their program in a certain time. They want to get working and taking a leave of absence can be difficult, um, for them. So it, it's a, it's a difficult conversation to have, but, and, and it's awful, often helpful to do so collaboratively. But in this case, her symptoms and documentation really don't support her ability to meet the essential requirements. And so Hannah did consider all of this information and did take a leave of absence. So we'll go to the next slide. So Hannah did take a one year leave of absence from the program and she contacted the program to express her readiness to return. However, there was some uh, residual concussion and back symptoms that she was still experienced. Um, so this included ongoing fatigue, continued challenges with prolonged screen use, back pain, inability to lift heavy things, slowed processing of new information um, due to slower reading, but also sleep disturbances and subsequent fatigue. And both the program and accessibility services had uh, met with her to, to talk about program return and did note that she was having some communication challenges. So, you know, a flat affect, taking long to process. Um, she wasn't really initiating the discussion, but sort of just waiting for questions to be asked to her. So, so this was a concern as well. So we'll move on to the next slide. I think we're just going to skip this poll for uh, time purposes. And so we'll go on to the next slide. So there are a couple of considerations for returning to the program. So this is from a program perspective and accessibility service perspective. Again, we have two columns. So from the program, there's retention of the knowledge base and skills. So if you're a, you know, a year away from the program, do you remember what you learned in the first year of the program? Have you maintained that knowledge and the motor skills? Um, being up to date on practice changes and new knowledge. I think we all know over the past two years, there's been huge updates to uh, practices and, and new knowledge, just all of the infection control protocols that you now need to be aware of. Um, treating patients uh, in the world of COVID-19 is completely different. So, you know, the students need to gain that knowledge. Um, and also the physical and cognitive stamina and the impact on the clinical environment with respect to patient safety and um, with respect to meeting the essential requirements. Um, and then I'll pass it along to Irene. Next slide, please. Uh, so again, uh, we're going to talk here a little bit about uh, you know the student took a the student took a leave, um, and sometimes people think, well, she stepped out of the program, and there were lots of issues as whether the student needed to step out and could step back in. But there was a lot of things we felt we could do to help the student work on a possible return to the program. And so there are uh, several areas to talk about preparation and skill building, uh, some of the rehabilitation she needed, uh, functional abilities evaluation that was undertaken, and then some remediation and refreshers with the actual program. Next slide, please. Next, thank you. Um, so 
this again is just driving home the point that there may be interim work to do before returning. So it's not just about accommodation in the moment, but some skill building, rehabilitation, and remediation that needs some before coming back into the program, uh, perhaps with revised accommodation. Next one. Uh, so preparation and skill building, she needed, uh, Hannah needed to review requirements for program staff and her disability impacts to see what they were like when she was ready to return again, when we were considered again. Um, we also, she had wanted some aspects of the program modified or reduced, which would have compromised the essential skills containment. So we wanted to look at adding coaching, coaching sessions and her ongoing rehabilitation to see if we could support her being able to have some uh, re gaining of skills and look at uh, whether coaching sessions could help her um, in managing disability impacts as well. Uh, there was also speech therapy uh, in, um, uh, intervention as well to help with some of the communication difficulties she was having. And that speech therapy continued right through her return to the actual uh, practical setting. Next one. Um, so there was a lot of cognitive, communica uh, cognitive and communication support that we had to do. There were lots of symptoms she was experiencing. She was noting information processing speed difficulties, reading comprehension challenges, um, and attentional difficulties, which led us to believe that we needed to get a better um, understanding of these ongoing persisting symptoms uh, that might have been aggravated by the summer injury as well. So we actually had a neuropsychological assessment done, both to point out the areas of challenge, but also to help direct the skill building and the rehab team that was involved um, in, in terms of figuring out skills. Next one. So the other thing um, that might be helpful for students returning to a program is the functional abilities evaluation. Um, so especially if they have a complex disability or a lot of physical and cognitive um, challenges. So the purpose of the functional abilities evaluation is to assist in determining patient and student safety and determining if students can do components of the essential requirements. So these FIEs are uh, administered by external um, companies or external healthcare providers um, that are experts in return to the work and they're really helpful in these situations. They use objective and measurable tests um, to guide the, uh, the ability of the student. And it's really helpful for them to have a description of the internship or the setting requirements to help with these um, with their assessment. And the documentation can inform accommodations. So because Hannah continued to have back pain and reports difficulty with heavy lifting, as well as the cognitive pieces with the concussion, we felt that an FIE would be helpful to guide suitable placement sites and accommodations. So for example, lifting restrictions. So next slide. So the other thing I, I mentioned earlier that the ability to retain skills is definitely is something of concern for students coming back into the program. So having a refresher or remedial activities can be helpful. This learning and skill loss is recognized by professional colleges. So for example, many have hour requirements uh, that you have to show that you've done to renew your licenses. So having a, a remediation or refresher um, component or activities can be helpful to support the student's return. So these can be structured or they could be independent but supportive. So in terms of Hannah's case, what we did is we arranged, uh, we created a Quirkus course with independent learning activities and weekly sessions with a professional. So she was able to do independent case-based learning and discuss those cases with a physiotherapist um, for that feedback piece. And we also collaborated with accessibility services at this point to ensure that, um, you know, accommodations were in place so that, you know, adaptive software or strategies around pacing and learning and fatigue management, because I think we wanted to cram it all in there so she could get back out to placement, but we needed to think about the fatigue and, and spacing these things out. So next slide. So we're gonna shift gears a little bit um, and talk a little bit about considerations for students as they progress through the program. So we have four things that we're gonna talk about in more detail. So planning for accommodations as practical demands increased, essential requirements, again, coming back to those and considering them, skill building and adjustments as uh, students progress through the program. So we're gonna move on to the first one. Next slide. So as um, students progress through their program, the practicum accommodations need to consider that the practicum demands uh, increase. So some of the ways that practicum demands may increase are an increased caseload requirement. So they need to see you know, more patients per day. 
The complexity of the patient presentation changes. So earlier on in the program, there's the clinical instructors might uh, have students seeing more simpler patients where they're in, in the end of the program, they're more responsible for complex patients. There's an emphasis on time management skills in the practicum setting, again, to address patient administrative needs to help them meet those case of requirements. The levels of collaboration can increase, so there's a higher expectation for students to initiate that collaboration and take the lead, uh, more com conflict management situations, and there's a higher expectation of independence with client care and caseload management. So accommodations must take into consideration um, the need for independence tasks and tasks and increasing need for mastery of tasks. So in Hannah's case, the accommodations um, will shift from being more like, for example, a template and feedback to be more, um, you know, site initiated to Hannah's initiating those things. And also some of the accommodations need to be adjusted to the setting. So the type of healthcare service, the pace of the healthcare system and physical demands. And we'll move on to the next slide. So the program essential requirements uh, are continued to be a consideration. So it's continued monitoring of the essential requirements. It's important for us to focus on the what and not the how. So, you know, what is the actual outcome that the, the students need to demonstrate and not necessarily on how they demonstrate it. So they could demonstrate it in a completely different way. That's not necessarily the norm as long as it's safe for the student and the patient, uh, but really it's about the what. But some common practicum requirements include a number of total practicum hours, a patient place, a patient setting and patient population, and demonstration of competencies. So for example, in physical therapy, Hannah needed to complete uh, 10, 50 hours of placement. Then she needed to have a placement in acute care, rehab, and community. Uh, there are variable cognitive demands, physical lifting demands, uh, and she had to require a caseload of at least 75%. So we spent a lot of time considering placement settings and working with Hannah to determine a, a good fit. And next slide. Okay, and just uh, uh, to build on what Jamie's already said, uh, there's a constant sort of increasing in skill building and independence, and both in acting in a practicum, but also in managing disability impacts. So Hannah worked heavily with the coach and also with the learning strategist, where uh, we worked to shift the accommodation wording to reflect that Hannah would self-initiate using a lot of the tools, rather than early in the uh, practicums where we had a lot more guidance around this and um, this is also just increased her independence and also to sort of meet with the essential skills of the program that she had increasing independence in managing her own work and managing uh, uh, patient care. So the coach continued throughout these actually the remaining placements as well. Uh, next one. Uh, so there are adjustments, as we, we said, that uh, need to be uh, put in place. And it's kind of a very dynamic process because the complexity of settings may change, but also the amount of independence and action for the student in clinical practice would change. And that's that collaborative process again. Um, we also spent a lot of time trying to get uh, feedback both from the program and the student to how things are going. Also seeing there's a match between how those were going uh, and also tweaking accommodations as necessary. And you know, very early on, Hannah, even though we did a lot of plans in place, we talked about increased headache and fatigue, and we had to make some adjustment in the hours and the way they were delivered. And actually, Hannah also considered her living situation and also would help support um, how uh, uh, she was getting to placements and what we could do to support her. But we worked also with the rehab team to also look where we could rearrange some things that she could still meet the requirements, but manage some of this uh, surge and resurgence of symptoms. So making sure there was a break between them, the, the different uh, units that she was done to kind of like have a recovery period as well. Um, next one. So all of this moves and Hannah moves through the program or the student called Hannah moves through the program, but also as the program uh, completion goes on, we work about how she might transition some into the workplace. We're wanting to build the skill building. That's the importance of skill building, not just accommodation, is how will the student carry this into their own practice and how they can use what they've learned about what works for them in these practicums in a workplace setting and choosing workplace settings that will best allow them to use their skills and best support them around disability impacts. Um, this, there was a comment made this morning in the student panel about formal and informal accommodations. And there are lots of pluses and minuses for that. And I understand uh, the push-pull between uh, uh, identifying uh, many uh, practical uh, exams and formal licensing exams 
require a, a, a very formal history of accommodation to have accommodations for those exams. So it's another reason for connecting with an accessibility office so that we are able to write letters that outline the kinds of accommodations you were formally receiving while in our programs that will support those going into your licensing exams as well. And then opportunities, we encourage students to work with our career department and also with our own departments and, and programs around um, employment uh, interviewing skills, um, how to talk about your disability um, when you're in an interview, when to talk about your disability and how you might talk about it with prevent, uh, pot uh, potential employers. So let, uh, next slide and really our last slide, just some key messages, lots of said today hope it's helpful, um, that uh, accommodation is a real collaborative and dynamic process. And I want to stress the collaboration part with both the program and the student and accessibility service, but the dynamic nature of it, that need to kind of revisit it many times, these programs. Time and careful planning is required um, to translate academic accommodations into clinical settings. And consider both the student learning and client care that's, uh, that in, in considering accommodations. And that your accommodations could also support skill building to support increasing competence and independence in managing disability. And that there may be, you know, and that the advocacy we do through our office and through programs that there may be many ways to demonstrate essential skills. Uh, and that a stop out may be beneficial. It's not necessarily being excluded from a program, but it may be beneficial in you actually completing the program and, and being able to uh, step back in. And just that uh, essential program requirements should clearly be identified and really helpful if they're identified so students can view them before entering programs, both to see if this program is a match for them, but also to start those conversations if they will need accommodations. Thank you for your time today. I'm not sure if we have a few minutes for questions or... Wonderful. Thank you, Irene and Jamie. Uh, we have about uh, four minutes for questions, and I'll read some of the questions that have been uh, posted in the chat here. We have a question from Deb Bruce. Uh, are you conducting express intakes with students? So if you mean in terms of like, uh, I'm not sure exactly what you mean in terms of express, each student has a full interview, an hour to an hour and a half. Uh, individually. So we are not doing any kind of group intakes. They're individually interviewed. They fill out their form and submit do documentation and uh, they have a full interview. Uh, so we're not doing any kind of uh, other kind of thing. There, there are some students who are being seen for consultations where they're in the process of getting documents or where, say, for example, they think they might have a learning disability and we're helping with the process to documentation, but we're not doing express uh, uh, interviews. It, it, the full interview really gives us that opportunity to um, really get a full picture. So that's where we operate right now. Thanks, Irene. Uh, we have another question. Uh, and for context, this question came up during the slides on internship considerations and potential potential practicum accommodations. Uh, can you speak about OSCEs as well? Sure, I can jump in and talk about OSCE. So uh, that's a great question. Thanks for asking that, because often OSCEs are sort of preparatory activities uh, for placements. So typically in terms of OSCEs, we would provide, um, you know, an extra time for reading the question and for the processing. Um, but actually when they're in and performing the skills, um, we don't typically provide extra time. Again, it's consideration of those um, caseload requirements and they need to complete a skill in a certain amount of time. And that has impacts on patients as well. If patients are expecting a 15 minute appointment and they're there for an hour that, you know, that could impact their day. Um, but there might be accommodations to go early or going late to uh, manage fatigue um, related or, um, you know, anxiety if waiting all day could, could be anxiety producing. So there are options there, but those are the most common ones that we will recommend. Yeah, and just to add to what Jamie said, the way we speak about it is we sort of see the OSCEs as mirroring a bit of they will have to do patient care or patient activity, and we can't increase the time for the patient activity. So we can help with how you read and uh, read the scenario or read this question and how you might write your answer. But that same idea of performing the action, we can't alter that uh, piece. So it's a great way to kind of start that early discussion uh, about what might you need in a practicum as well, too. Great. Thank you, Irene and Jamie. I think we have time for one more question, uh, another, another anonymous question. Uh, how do students access uh, assistive technology tools when they're required to be using workplace devices? Uh, often they're not permitted to bring their own tools into the setting. That's, that's a great question. So we uh, so um, fortunately, in some settings, uh, they, because uh, settings have employees who also have had accommodations, we are sometimes in a situation where they will own software, such as dictation software. 
In other cases, we are needing to purchase software that can be put into the computer on location. So we are, that would be part of our job to help arrange that software being made available that could be there uh, on site. Um, so of course they have to use devices on site. They can't take any device off site for privacy reasons. So we would be having those conversations through our practice and coordinators in the program to speak with the sites around what's available there. Uh, we are finding more increasingly, especially in larger settings like hospitals or you know, uh, large clinics that they have employees themselves who have accommodation needs. So they may already own some of these softwares. But in, in other cases, we are using things like student bursaries or through other funding through accessibility to make sure those um, uh, things are in place, along with things like ergonomic furniture, if it's not available in the setting, that would be something that we would be part of arranging uh, to be on site. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Irene. Uh, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for questions today. Just want to say a big thank you again to Jamie and Irene for the presentation, uh, as well as a thank you to Anna and Marcia uh, for interpreting today's session. Uh, we will see you all back in 15 minutes uh, for our next session. Hi, Sari and Marcia. I, oh, there I am. Now, I don't see myself. I only see you in the break slide. I do see you. Uh, Hold on. Marcia, you can see Sari, right? OK, perfect. Oh, here we uh, go. Sari, here we can, go. You, can you see Marcia as well, the interpreter? Yes, there okay. you are. Perfect. The camera confuses me. I never know what I'm looking at. So yeah, no, for sure. For sure. It's a little bright. I think I'm going to shut one of the blinds here. Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the break. We're going to head into our next session. Uh, first, uh, let's do the access check. So we understand access to be shared responsibility between everyone in this space. We will strive to create an accessible space that reduces the need for you to disclose a disability or impairment for the purpose, uh, purposes of gaining an accommodation. In doing this together, we strive to welcome disability and the changes it brings into our space. Okay, so, uh, sorry. Is there anything about the virtual space that we should address now? Are there any other access needs that might affect your participation in the workshop that we could also address? Next slide, please. Okay. Um, my name is Gretel Silvestre. I am on Location Accessibility Advisor at Accessibility Services for the St. George campus. I will be moderating this session on critical legal cases in professional faculty accommodations, a review with Sari Spring. I am a Latina woman in my 40s with aqua hair and glasses. My Zoom background is of the Progress Pride flag. Okay. Um, on the next slide, we will go over in this slide, sorry, on how you can submit a response to either of these two questions, as well as for the rest of the conference. So, <clears throat> sorry, throughout the conference, all speakers will describe visual elements as best as they can. We welcome participants to turn off their camera, get up and move around, and take as many screen breaks as they need to go uh, to do throughout the conference. This slide shows a visual of the Zoom control at the bottom of your screen. Use the Q&A to submit questions for the presenters if you experience any technical difficulties and require assistance. 
you're able to submit questions anonymously. If you prefer to ask your question live, you can use the raise hand feature and you will be asked to unmute yourself. Keyword users, option plus Y on Mac or alternate plus Y on Windows. Mouse users, select participants, choose raise hand at bottom of panel. We respectfully request that you wait until the designated question period to ask questions using either the Q&A or raise hand feature. Note that moderators may not be able to get to all questions. We are real-time captioning the entire conference. To enable text captioning, click on live transcript and select show subtitles. Text captioning is auto enabled on mobile devices. We also have sign language interpreting for the entire conference, which is available on laptop and desktop com computers. Please submit a question via the Q&A feature if you are experiencing any technical difficulties. Okay, next slide, please. So Sari Springer has been practicing law for over 30 years. She's a dedicated, compassionate, focused, and efficient practitioner who leaves no stone in turn in servicing her clients. Sari has developed a hybrid practice, focusing on employment law as well as higher education law. In terms of her employment law practice, Sari acts for management to provide strategic, practical, and thorough advice with respect to all matters that arise in the life cycle of the employment relationship. This includes advice and counsel regarding, regarding the promotion and onboarding process, the hiring process, and the myriad of issues that arise while the employee is employed, which are boundless. Sari has developed a particular proficiency in the human rights arena having guided numerous clients through the complexities of employer obligations and successfully settling and defending high stakes cases at the Human Rights Tribunal of Ontario. In terms of her higher education practice, Sari has acted for multiple universities throughout her career and in particular, particular has defended universities in connection with numerous human rights applications filled at the Ontario Human Rights Tribunal. In that regard, Sari has had an unblemished record of success in resolving these cases, either resettling them in mediation, having the cases dismissed on a preliminary basis at summary hearing, and or having the cases dismissed following complex hearings on the merits. Let's welcome Sari. Hello, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I am so happy to have been invited to speak at this conference. Uh, the only thing I regret is that we are not in person because I have a feeling I know many of you who are in this virtual audience and I would love to be able to say hello in person, give you a hug, have you participate in this uh, presentation that I'm giving. I think uh, uh, for those of you who, who know me, often my presentations are interactive and we engage together in discussion or in role playing, but unfortunately we can't do that in this forum, but nonetheless, a shout out to all of my friends um, in the virtual audience. Um, I understand I'm supposed to explain uh, what I look like and where I am uh, to make sure it's accessible to everybody. So I am a woman close to 60 years old uh, with long brown hair and wearing a light blue sweater. Uh, I'm sitting in my home office uh, up here on Shanty Bay uh, on Lake Simcoe. So uh, let's move on to the presentation. Uh, first of all, again, another shout out to the organizers uh, of this conference. Uh, I work very closely with you and you know how much I respect uh, and adore you. But when I look at the name of the conference itself, Strengthening and Accessibility and Inclusion, within professional programs. That's so apropos um, because uh, we, we are here to strengthen accessibility and inclusion, but what that means is we already have uh, a robust foundation in terms of understanding where we need to go here. Um, and that is um, incredibly accurate in terms of the fact that I know from personal experience and working with many universities across the province that this sector in particular and you uh, people in particular are probably the most sophisticated people that I know that address accommodations uh, of students and of 
uh, staff and faculty. And so you already are the gold standard in my view, uh, in terms of um, thinking through these issues and really embracing them wholeheartedly. And really what this conference about is just kicking it up, kicking it up a notch, if that's even possible. Uh, and I hope to, to do that in some small way with, with my presentation this afternoon. So uh, first slide, please. All right, so uh, as mentioned in the introduction, my role uh, in this conference and over the next hour is to provide you with the legal overview with respect to accommodations obligations within the university sector and in particular in professional programs. And uh, in so doing, I'm going to take you through a variety of issues. So next slide, please. So that's me, uh, you know who I am, so we can skip to the next slide. All right, so here is the agenda that I'm going to be following over the next hour. Uh, I am going to start with a basic overview of the legal obligations pursuant to a statute called the Ontario Human Rights Code. Uh, I'm then going to speak in further detail about the duty to accommodate, which falls under the Human Rights Code. Uh, then I'm going to move on to providing you with an overview of some uh, recent interesting reported cases at the Human Rights Tribunal uh, of Ontario, and actually there's one from the British Columbia Human Rights Tribunal as well. And then I'm going to conclude with addressing some common pain points that I know the university sector, and in particular the accessibility services uh, people within the universities uh, are experiencing and hoping to, to provide you with my perspective and, and again, engage if we, if we can in um, back and forth discussion based on your questions. Okay, so next slide, please. All right, so we're going to begin with a basic overview of the Human Rights Code and forgive me to those of you who know this already, and most of you probably do, um, just by virtue of what you do. It's either intuitive because you work uh, in this sector and just know it, or because you've heard my spiel before at, at other conferences. But regardless, I think it is important to start with the basics before we get into the detail, just to make sure that we're all refreshed on these issues and we're all uh, talking from the same page. So. Next slide, please. Okay, so first of all, the Ontario Human Rights Code, um, to refresh everyone on this um, presentation, is the statute in the province of Ontario that addresses discrimination matters. Um, it, like I always say, it's a very small statute, um, but it packs a big punch. Um, by that I mean it's not very lengthy, but it has an enormous effect on, on the peoples uh, that live and work and receive services in Ontario. By way of fundamentals, um, the Ontario Human Rights Code um, applies in uh, five areas and deals with 16 enumerated grounds. And by that I mean um, the Ontario Human Rights Code um, prohibits discrimination in five different areas, including services, employment, good services and facilities, um, housing, and um, membership in vocational institutions. So where does that fit for today's presentation? Where that fits is that universities fall within the services area of the code because universities provide educational services to its students. And accordingly, there is no doubt that we are bound to abide by the provisions in the code and all of the um, policies that are promulgated by the Human Rights Commission, which is the body that interprets the code. Um, the Human Rights Code also applies um, to the university in the context of employment. In other words, treating employees um, and, and um, professors, uh, et cetera, as well uh, with respect to um, non-discrimination matters, but, but that's a, a lecture for another day. I'm going to focus on 
services, which is the provision of educational services to our students. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so as I mentioned before, um, the Human Rights Code um, applies to non-discrimination in the provision of services and prohibits discrimination on 16 grounds. What I mean by that is that the Human Rights Code says that we cannot discriminate in the provision of our educational services on the basis of a whole host of factors, including age, creed, color, religion, sex, sexual orientation, um, gender identity, gender expression, ethnic origin, place of origin, record of offenses, etc. cetera. Uh, what I'm focusing on today that's most relevant to this conference is the ground of disability. In other words, uh, what the Human Rights Code tells us is that we cannot discriminate in the provision of educational services in respect of, amongst other things, someone's disability. Disability is defined um, on this slide in front of you and it goes into some detail uh, and it's uh, the definition that's outlined in the code, but basically in a nutshell, disability includes any physical or mental disability. What it doesn't include, for example, is the flu or a passing um, type of illness but anything that one, any disability that one has uh, that, that has been diagnosed as a mental or physical disability is covered as a protected ground under the code. Next slide, please. So um, as I mentioned, disability um, includes both physical and mental conditions, but most importantly, um, it has a broad definition. Um, and um, it includes not only uh, disabilities that are diagnosed, but perceived disabilities. And by that, I mean that if we as an institution or someone within the accessibility services department or a professor or an, instru an instructor perceives that someone has a disability, even though the student hasn't come forward to declare that they have one, we have an obligation to address this. Um, and in particular, we have an obligation to inquire and to not sweep this under the rug because the student hasn't proactively come forward to disclose. It may be at the end of the day that the student actually does not have a disability, but most importantly, the code and the case law tells us that we can't just ignore this, we need to look into it and, and address it. Um, discrimination can be both direct and indirect. And again, what that means is that we can experience or someone can experience discrimination uh, directly because someone has specifically uh, decided um, not to provide accommodations or to treat someone negatively because of their um, protected ground, their disability, but it can also be indirect. In other words, policies or whatnot that on their face don't appear to directly discriminate, but by implication or by innuendo, they ultimately end up discriminating. The, the example that I often use um, is um, a policy or a practice where in the workplace, employees will often go out on a Thursday evening um, to enjoy drinks and, and get to know each other on a more personal level. Although that's not a direct discrimination scenario, it could be an indirect discrimination scenario as it relates to individuals who have uh, family obligations and need to get home to pick up their children from daycare. So that would be discrimination indirectly on the basis of family status. Okay. Next slide, please. Okay, so now I'm going to focus on the duty to accommodate, which I'm sure is very near and dear to everyone's hearts who are participating in this program, because really, this is what we all do. This is what we all live and breathe. Um, you do it from a practical perspective at your various institutions. 
I do it from a legal perspective to ensure that my clients are properly adhering to the accommodation obligations under the code and also that um, they understand where the limits are in terms of what their obligations are to accommodate. So moving on to the next slide, please. So accommodation, first of all, has two components, each of which are just as important as the other. So the substantive component, I think we all get, that is um, actually um, reviewing and implementing the accommodations that are uh, required, and I'll get into that in a moment in terms of what that means, um, to be sure that someone is able to function and is not being discriminated against or treated differently because of their disability. What it also includes, which sometimes gets lost or overlooked, is a procedural requirement or a procedural component. And what that means is that we as institutions or people working within these institutions have an obligation to ensure that we invoke a proper structured process um, to address accommodation inquiries and to address potential accommodations that we are assessing to determine whether or not they are appropriate. And so where um, institutions often get stuck or into trouble is when they don't go through these procedures in a methodical and, and, and substantive way. They do what I call a back of the napkin assessment of what they think, although not thoroughly, um, they can potentially implement as a form of accommodation. What they don't do is actually assess it in a structured and methodical basis. And that's where they often get stuck or into trouble at the human rights tribunal hearing. So in, in one piece of advice I can give to everyone, if you don't already do this, is make sure to keep copious notes of exactly what you are doing to try to implement accommodations because if we're ever taken to task on it down the road uh, we will need to establish that and as I said the back of the napkin assessments will not hold water at a tribunal hearing. All right next slide please. So um, other areas where um, institutions often get into trouble is that they take too long to implement the accommodations. Um, again, I, I'm certainly preaching to the converted here, I assume, based on who is participating in this conference, that you probably all have very um, high functioning processes and start very early on in terms of assessing accommodations for students um, who need them. Uh, and I would assume that most in institutions advise the students uh, long before the semester begins about what they need to do to get their accommodations implemented in terms of contacting the accessibility services uh, unit and uh, getting everything aligned in a timely fashion. Um, and at the same time, the university needs to act on this as well uh, in a timely fashion. Um, the other concept, and I'll speak more about this in one of the cases, that students are not entitled to perfect accommodations. They are entitled to reasonable accommodations. And so um, students may prefer to have a certain accommodation that they think more suits their needs or their preferences more particularly, but we don't necessarily have to agree to what they insist on or what their um, uh, physician insists on. We as the education provider certainly have an ability to use our own, um, uh, uh, our own guideposts in terms of what we believe um, is an acceptable and reasonable accommodation. And we can choose the least expensive form of accommodation if multiple options are available. Um, even though the student may not be um, as excited about that, we, the, the courts and the tribunals recognize that um, we are um, entitled to make financially responsible decisions as well. 
All right, next slide, please. Um, again, I think as we all know, accommodation is a multi-party inquiry um, and it is uh, an inquiry that uh, in, in, involves collaboration between both the university and the student. And again, you'll see that in a couple of the reported cases I'm going to be uh, going through in a moment that um, the student can't sit back and fold their arms and not engage. Um, and indicate essentially that this is your problem, not mine. It, it's not, it's, it's everyone's issue to address in a harmonious and collaborative fashion. And the duty to inquire, I touched on a little bit earlier, which is again, if a professor uh, or a practicum supervisor or a department head seems to believe that a student has a disability that has not been identified and it would likely be a mental health disability, um, they have to, um, in a compassionate and sensitive way, uh, have a confidential conversation with the student and try to assess whether in fact there is something more here than a student simply acting out or a student simply going silent or a student suddenly um, having um, attendance issues in class. So um, saying uh, the student didn't come forward is, is not a defense. Um, okay, and I believe I've already addressed the third bullet point. So let's move on to the next slide, please. <clears throat> so here's the defense. <clears throat> and here is what um, we are always looking at most precisely. So the Ontario Human Rights Code tells us that we can discriminate against people, including students, in the provision of services if the student is unable to fulfill the essential duties and requirements of the program, full stop. However, and here's the big, the big kicker, the tribunal will not find that the student is incapable of fulfilling the essential requirements of the duty, and therefore we are allowed to discriminate unless the institution has first tried to accommodate the student and the accommodation is not possible due to cost, outside sources of funding, or health and safety requirements. And that is called the undue hardship defense. So again, just to recap, what the legislation and the case law tells us is that we can discriminate against students and not provide them with accommodations if they can't fulfill the essential duties of the program, but only once we've attempted accommodation and that accommodation will cause us undue hardship. Okay, so next slide, please. So undue hardship is assessed based on three factors and three factors only. Um, that is cost, outside sources of funding, and health and safety requirements. And let me begin by saying that the undue hardship defense is an extremely high bar to meet. Um, and essentially, in terms of, for example, cost, if we are going to rely on a cost uh, factor as the undue hardship defense, the university would need to establish that essentially, Funding the accommodation would cause the university to go bankrupt. Unless we can prove that, and again, not a back of the napkin assessment, but really prove it based on substantiated evidence from objective witnesses, we will not be able to reach that undue hardship defense of cost. Outside sources of funding um, is a similar um, part of this element. And essentially what that says is that we have an obligation to look at whether or not we can get funding from other sources to facilitate the um, accommodation. So for example, if there are, um, uh, is, if there's extra funding from government sources, uh, from other private institutions that tend to provide financial assistance to persons with a specific type of disability, for example. We need to reach out 
to those sources to see whether or not they can assist with the funding if the funding is going to be too onerous for the institution. Finally, the health and safety requirements. That is actually the one that I deal with most often with not only university clients, but actually with all clients, because this is the one that causes everyone the most heartburn. Um, because it, it, it's a difficult one to grapple with. And I would suspect most of the sleepless nights that you have all had relate to whether or not we can allow a student to carry on in a professional program, and usually it's a practicum type program, nursing, um, medicine, uh, social work, uh, dentistry, those sorts of, or pharmacy, those sorts of programs uh, where the student will put himself or herself or themselves or the persons to whom they are uh, providing healthcare services to at a health and safety risk if we allow them into this practicum. And again, if we are going to rely on that defense, which is a legitimate one, absolutely, we need to be able to establish that with clear and cogent evidence. So it's not just, I think this is going to cause a health and safety risk to the patients, or I'm fairly certain it will, we need to actually bring in specialists or experts to explain why. Okay, next slide, please. Um, so we can't uh, consider uh, other factors like institutional convenience or preferences as um, part of the undue hardship defense, uh, we have to only stick with the three enumerated elements that I explained, cost, outside sources of funding, and health and safety requirements. Those are the three and the only three elements that we can look at to establish undue hardship. And also, I think it goes without saying that it is our onus to prove that undue hardship exists, not the reverse or the corollary, which is the student has the onus to prove that it doesn't exist. Okay, next slide, please. All right, so now for the interesting cases across Canada that have been reported, and this is where it's there but the grace of God go I cases, um, because I know none of us uh, want to end up at a tribunal case. Um, it's um, a very, lengthy, arduous, um, draining process for everyone involved. Um, even if we know we've got an extremely strong case and we are likely on the winning side of it, um, it, it litigation, as I say, is nobody's friend. Um, it's um, it, it, the Human Rights Tribunal in Ontario, for example, first of all, is extremely backlogged. There are thousands of cases in the queue at any given time. And so um, the hearings, which are like trials, uh, are typically scheduled at least two years down the road. Um, so this is going to drag on for a very long time. Um, it's also uh, draining in terms of time, um, expense, and energy for, for everybody involved. and. Um, Although the adjudicators are terrific, um, you never know how a case is going to go until you're actually in it. And um, there are often very strange twists and turns, uh, weird things happen. Um, and so we like to avoid this as much as possible. That having been said, I have represented many universities at the tribunal at full hearings over the course of my practice because it does occur that we just cannot resolve this, that the um, applicant, meaning the person who starts the claim, is taking a very unreasonable position. Um, they're demanding, for example, that they be granted a degree uh, or whatnot, and so here we are. Okay, so let's look at some of the cases uh, which have been reported and have been decided. Um, sorry, there's a request to go back to a concept. Um, 
So how shall I do this? Um, Gretel, do you want me to carry on or deal with this at the end or what's your, what's your pleasure? Oh, it's okay. The participant just said that they can, they can wait until the end. Okay. Okay. So okay, perfect. So until the end. So, Thank you. Okay. So I'll carry on with these the discussion of these cases and then I'll be sure to leave time at the end to address questions because actually that's the most fun part is uh, the interaction with the audience. Okay, so the first case is uh, O'Brien and George Brown College. So this is a recent case, a 2021 case from the Human Rights Tribunal of Ontario. And the adjudicator, in other words, the judge who decided this case, uh, his name is Doug Sanderson, and he was the vice chair of the Human Rights Tribunal for about 10 years. But fun fact, um, Doug has joined our office, um, joined our firm about mm, 10 months ago. Um, so uh, he's a great guy. He was a great adjudicator. I appeared before him on several occasions when I was there, and then he decided to uh, change tracks, and, and he's joined our firm. And so I have been able to have some I'll call them pillow talk discussions with him uh, about these cases that he he heard and, and ultimately determined. So, so I'm going to share some of that with you as well. Okay, so this case um, involves um, a, a gentleman named uh, Wayne O'Brien, who was in the social work program at George Brown College. And this case I find fascinating because I think a lot of us have dealt with this issue, which is the practicum placement abroad. So students who want to and have the option to do their practicum placements outside of, of the Toronto area or of Ontario. And I know a lot of students are very excited um, to take advantage of out of town placements because it's fun, it's different, it's exciting, it's an opportunity to um, uh, engage, you know, with others in a different jurisdiction and just have a change of scenery. But um, these can cause uh, issues if there's an accommodation that cannot be addressed. And I, I've actually had a very similar scenario with one of my clients relating to a student who wanted to take advantage of a practicum abroad. And uh, we, meaning the myself as legal counsel in the institution, decided that we could not allow that to happen for all sorts of legitimate reasons, and, and we did not. Um, thankfully, the student agreed and it didn't go to tribunal, but, but in this case, uh, not, not so. So Mr. O'Brien, um, as I mentioned, was a student in the social work program at George Brown College, and there was an ability for him to do a practicum placement in Jamaica. So uh, Mr. O'Brien has ADHD, and he was provided um, by George Brown College with all of the um, requested accommodations for the ADHD that he had, namely extensions for submitting work and those sorts of things. What happened, however, is that um, Mr. O'Brien gave um, a presentation um, locally here in, in Ontario first. And unfortunately, as Doug said in his decision, it was a shambles from start to finish. It was disorganized, it was illogical, it didn't make any sense, um, and, and it was just a disaster. And the purpose of the presentation was essentially to allow the university to gauge whether or not the student was able to go into a practicum setting uh, abroad. Um, and, and to give you a little bit more context, the practicum setting that the student was looking to go into in Jamaica was in a prison. Um, so in and of itself was um, a very precarious placement. Um, George Brown decided that they were not willing to allow uh, Mr. O'Brien to do the placement in Jamaica and offered him and found for him a placement here in Toronto, and he refused that. He then uh, files a complaint or what's called an application at the Human Rights Tribunal of Ontario alleging discrimination on the basis of disability. Namely, he alleged that 
his ADHD was what contributed to his very poor performance in the presentation. And accordingly, we discriminated by not taking that into account when refusing to allow him to embark upon this placement in a prison in Jamaica. The problem here is that when it came to hearing, um, and actually before the hearing, the university quite appropriately engaged with Mr. O'Brien time and time again to try to work through this issue. But Mr. O'Brien's problem or issue was that he refused to accept that his performance on this presentation with, was anything other than flawless. So essentially he was talking out of two sides of his mouth. On the one hand at the hearing, he was saying that the ADHD caused him not to perform properly, but yet when he was actually in the program and the university was trying to engage with him, he just wouldn't hear of anything other than, my presentation was perfect. I have no idea why you're not allowing me to go to Jamaica. And it was actually his lack of insight and his judgment that was the reason why the university decided they could not take the risk to send him into a prison placement in Jamaica. It was not anything to do with the ADHD. And in fact, they completely accommodated the ADHD, as I mentioned earlier, by giving him extra time on papers, exams, and so forth. And so, um, at the end of the day, the university was successful and the case was dismissed. Okay, um, next slide, please. All right, so this is Gamash in York University. This case is a little bit older. It's from 2013, again, an Ontario Human Rights Tribunal case. Uh, Mark Hart um, was the adjudicator. Some of you may remember him from a presentation that we did together at the University of Toronto tri-campus um, session. It was pre-COVID. Um, he, he's also a fantastic adjudicator and similarly uh, left to do other things, but I have enormous respect for him. Anyway, this case um, involved a student, Mr. Gamash, who was in uh, Teachers College at York University and who had a disability in which he was uh, visually impaired. Um, this student uh, failed the first practicum and um, it was alleged that the university failed to accommodate the student by not providing him with the reading materials in an accessible format in a timely manner. So like most programs, um, this program involved both a didactic in-class uh, session and then also practicums. Um, so when he failed the practicum, he alleged that the failure was because he hadn't received the reading materials um, in a timely manner. Um, at the end of the day, Mark Hart found that the university did provide Mr. Gamash with the overwhelming majority of accommodations that he had requested for his visual impairment, including um, uh, reading materials in, uh, um, in an accessible format. But where he found against them was that they did not do it in a timely manner. And essentially what happened was there was confusion within the university, and this can happen because we are all enormous institutions with many arms and many players. There was some confusion between the accessibility services uh, departments and others, which did result in a couple of months delay. Um, that having been said, um, Mark Hart acknowledged that um, even though the university did not provide the reading materials in an accessible format as quickly as they should have, the university did establish that the student's failure in the program was not actually material effect, materially affected by the university's failure to give the student the materials in a timely fashion. And so the remedy was um, very uh, minimal 
Um, it was essentially a slap on the wrist and I think it was a couple of thousand dollars. Um, but it's interesting to note that we can still get stuck, I'll call it, or a little bit into trouble, even if at the end of the day, the failure to accommodate did not result in materially affecting the student, but the finding in and of itself can cause us a little bit of a problem. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, this, this case is uh, Hickey and Everest Colleges, um, again, a little bit older from 2009. Um, this is a case involving a dental assistant program. Um, the student in this program had had a car accident and accordingly had some physical uh, limitations as a, as a result of the car accident. And in particular, could not stand um, for lengthy periods of time. And so the student requested to do four hour shifts in the practicum for the dental assistant program instead of the usual eight hour shifts. And that therefore would have resulted in the student completing the practicum outside of the normal two week window that's allotted. Um, the college here was found to have been in breach because um, for whatever reason, and I don't quite understand it, they dug their heels in and said, no, no, you must complete this practicum within two weeks. Um, the ministry, according to them, although they didn't prove it, apparently requires um, students to finish this practicum within two weeks, but because they weren't able to actually establish that, that, that defense fell uh, through quite quickly. Um, and so ultimately the college was found to have breached um, their obligations under the code by not engaging in this accommodations process. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, this is a British Columbia uh, human rights tribunal case. The law in British Columbia basically mirrors the law in Ontario. Um, this case is from 2018. And this case I brought forward just because it's a little bit different in that it dealt with whether or not a case can be dismissed um, early before moving ahead to be heard on the merits. So in other words, British Columbia, like Ontario, has um, an ability to have cases dismissed at first instance um, if the case, even if true on its facts, does not establish a nexus between what happened and a potential breach of the human rights legislation. And so quite frankly, I try to use this early dismissal avenue as often as I can when uh, applicants or students bring forward allegations of discrimination, but when you peel back the onion, actually it is not a case of discrimination, it's a case of something completely different. Anyway, in this particular case, um, this involved a nursing program um, at Sprott Shaw uh, Community College, and the student had ADHD, again. Um, she had several instructors um, in the didactic portion of the program. The first instructor um, gave the student all of the accommodations for her ADHD that she needed. Again, extra time, quiet uh, rooms to take exams and that sort of thing. So that all went well. The second instructor that she had in class, however, for whatever reason, did not implement the accommodations for ADHD as seamlessly as the first one. Okay, so then we move into the practicum part of the program. So the student goes out to her placement, her nursing placement, and the student um, starts to act extremely unprofessionally. Um, she's got attitude issues. She's posting all kinds of negative things on her Facebook page about the program and about her colleagues and her instructors. And the student is ultimately dismissed because of a code of student conduct breach, which I think, again, we all know what that means. So the students breached the code of student conduct in relation to her behavior. Um, she files a complaint at the British Columbia Human Rights Tribunal alleging discrimination on the basis of disability 
because she had ADHD and wasn't accommodated. The university brings this preliminary motion to get the case dismissed saying, wait a second, um, regardless of whether or not the student was accommodated for her ADHD in the didactic component of the course, that has nothing to do with the fact that she was terminated from the program because of her lack of professionalism or her behavior. So what are we doing here? Um, and that actually makes a lot of sense and it's a great argument. Unfortunately, the community college lost on its preliminary argument because what the student countered with is no, 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 no. What I am alleging here is that the instructor who didn't provide me with the accommodations in a seamless fashion was the same instructor who evaluated me in the practicum. And that instructor had a preconceived bias against me because of the fact that I had a class for ADHD accommodations and she didn't give it to me. And that's why I've been blackballed here and that's why I've been dismissed. So with that information, um, the tribunal decided that um, this case had enough to move forward on the merits and allowed the case to proceed. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, um, this case um, again is a um, York University case um, decided by my now colleague, uh, Doug Sanderson. Um, and again, this is, this is a great case um, because even though it doesn't deal with practicum issues, it does address um, in a very detailed fashion, the issue of medical evidence and how much medical evidence we need in order to establish, um, or rather how much medical evidence the student needs in order to establish their disability. And so this is again, something that's very close to our hearts as litigators and as uh, persons who are working in the accessibility services offices to determine what we need to do in terms of accommodation obligations. So, so in this particular case, um, uh, this student uh, was in a PhD program in anthropology. And the student did have a mental health disability. He was bipolar. Um, and he passed the first comprehensive exam, which as you probably know as academics is essentially a lengthy paper. But he failed the second comprehensive exam. And this was so even though um, we gave him um, extensive accommodations and in particular, a lot of extra time to complete the comprehensive exam. So um, as you know, PhD programs are usually five, six years. And in this particular case, the student was afforded the entire six years just to get through the comprehensive exams, which normally are done within the first year or so of the program, and the balance of the years of the program are used to prepare the thesis, do the research, defend the thesis, and so forth. So the university did accommodate him extensively in terms of providing lots of extra, lots of extra time. The student, however, alleged that his disability caused him to fail the second comprehensive exam and to be ultimately thrown out of the program. Um, at the end of the day, the tribunal decided, no, it wasn't because the student failed to produce any medical evidence to substantiate that the ramifications of his bipolar disorder actually impacted his ability to complete and succeed in these comprehensive exams. He was the one who kept articulating that um, I overanalyze too much and this is what's causing me the problems and this is why I can't get through these exams. Um, but the medical evidence did not establish that um, remotely. Um, he also, during, um, the time he was in the program, never articulated that there was any 
um, manifestation other than needing extra time to complete the exam. So while we do recognize retroactive accommodation, which is looking at something after the fact that wasn't known at the time as something important to us to potentially backpedal, this case was different because even if we had taken that approach, there was no medical evidence to substantiate that the reason he couldn't get through these exams was actually related to the disability. Um, at the end of the day, um, what uh, Doug found was that there was simply um, a cognitive um, uh, inability to complete this, um, this component of the course. And that's okay, but that's not a ground upon which we need to accommodate. Um, and this is a theme that's picked up in some of the cases, which is essentially not every shortcoming is a disability. And that's fine. Um, someone cannot simply have the goods to complete the course, but that doesn't mean that they have a disability that requires accommodation. For example, I will never be fast enough to win a gold medal um, in an Olympic competition. That doesn't mean I have a disability. It just means that I don't have that capability. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so I'm just gonna spend a couple more minutes on pain points so I can leave five minutes at the end for discussion. So next slide, please. So these are um, some of the issues that I know we're all grappling with. So let me just give you my two cents on where we go with these. Um, the first issue is, um, can we forward medical information that's provided to the University Accessibility Services Office onto the practicum site uh, without fresh consent from the student? The short answer is no. Um, for privacy reasons, we need to ensure that we have the student's consent um, before we share um, personal health information relating to accommodations with a practicum. And my practical advice to you is to obviously set this up from the get-go, that you have the student sign documents that indicate that the information that they are providing to you, they are approving to be shared with um, not only professors and those dealing with the in-class program, but also those engaged in the practicum component of the program. The second pain point are these crazy doctor's notes um, that insist on unreasonable accommodations. For example, students never having to take a test. I know, again, as a practitioner, I see a lot of these and you just shake your head and, and, and you know, can't even try to fathom how a doctor can write such a note. The bottom line is, is first of all, doctors do not dictate our accommodations at best. Doctors provide us with suggestions for accommodations. It's the university that ultimately has the authority to either accept or not accept those accommodations. Furthermore, um, the university has an obligation to ensure that the student has successfully completed the essential requirements of the program. And if the only way to assess that is that the student has to take a test, then the student has to take a test. Um, if there is no reasonable accommodation that can similarly assess the student uh, to, um, um, to uh, master this um, requirement other than taking a test, then we have the authority to insist on taking a test. The next bullet point is um, students making belligerent demands for accommodation. I think we all know uh, we, just because someone is screaming loudly and making a big fuss does not mean that uh, we necessarily have to give them what they insist on. It's a collaborative process based on the reasonableness of, of everyone involved in the scenario. Next slide, please. Should core competencies of a particular program be well documented and publicized in advance? Absolutely. Um, it just makes life easier for everyone if the student knows in advance uh, exactly what is expected of them so that we can work together with them early on to accommodate. And then finally, um, over COVID and this world of Zoom that we're all living in, 
Um, there have been an increased number of students who are asking to complete their practicums remotely over Zoom um, and whether or not we are obligated to agree to that. So the short answer is if it's a student's preference, they, they just rather do it and not a disability related request, then the answer, if you don't want to give them that option is absolutely no. Um, on the other hand, if it is a request that's related to a disability, then again, it involves an assessment of whether or not um, we can properly assess the student's ability to master those skills in a remote setting as opposed to an in-person setting. And so that will depend on the circumstances, of course, of each, of each unique program. So there you have it. Um, I have a few minutes for questions. So Gretel, how would you like me to handle that? Do you want me to read the questions for you or do you wanna read them? Um, so yeah, why don't you read them to me? It'll just save me having to find them. Okay, it's okay. So first question. Sorry, can you please return to the concept of perceived to have or to have had a disability? Can you elaborate on the difference between discriminating based on a perceived disability, equally discriminatory as if the condition exists, versus the duty to accommodate something that was perceived to have had? Example in grade three, this does not necessarily require accommodation in university or field work. While we inquire and treat the person with dignity during an assessment or explorations, we do not accommodate something that is only perceived, especially once upon a time. Can you please comment on this? Yeah. Oh, thank you. Great, great question. So, okay, let, let, let me be a little bit more clear. So the um, person who asked the question is absolutely correct. We are not obligated to accommodate um, a perceived disability because the student has had a disability you know many many years ago and believes that it is continuing to impact them we only um, accommodate when we have specific information from the healthcare provider that um, does not disclose the nature of the disability but discloses the limitations that arise from the disability and suggestions for accommodation. What I mean by perceived disabilities is that if we notice that a student is, as I said before, all of a sudden absentee or withdrawn or um, is acting very strangely, um, we have an obligation to make inquiries. Are you having some issues? Is there a medical issue that is causing you some problems? If the student says no, we can move on. If the student says yes, then we go through the usual process of saying, okay, now let's look at what your healthcare provider says is impacting you, why it's impacting you, and then what we can do in a concrete fashion to accommodate. So I hope that clarifies that distinction. Okay, so it's three, but I think we can answer one more question if you're okay, Terry. Sure. Okay. So, um, if the university is basing a defense on health and safety requirements, can you speak more to what would constitute successful arguments for or against this and how this would be demonstrated? Sure. So, for example, uh, if we have. Um, a student who um, is, let's say, in a social work program or a counseling program that is going out into the public to provide counseling to um, students in elementary school, but that student has a mental health disability that results in them um, acting out in an aggressive manner without any prompting or rationale, and that student refuses to go through a um, occupational psychiatric assessment um, to understand how to deal with this issue and protect the students to whom they will be providing this service or interacting with, 
I say we have the legitimate right to say, no, this is a health and safety issue for these elementary school kids with whom the student will be engaging. And until we have a better understanding of what outbursts or aggression might, might happen or how we can minimize that, we are not prepared to place the student in that setting. Thank you very much. Sorry, this was an, uh, an amazing session. I really enjoyed it and I'm sure everybody else did. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Um, and if anybody has any questions after the fact, um, the folks at U of T know where to find me. So feel free to reach out and uh, enjoy the rest of the afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Hi everyone, so that brings us to the close of day one of the Strengthening Accessibility pro uh, Conference program. We are so excited that you're able to join us today and we are even more excited for you to join us uh, tomorrow, Thursday, June 16th, as well as Friday, June 17th for the remainder of the conference. Uh, we will be starting tomorrow at 8.45, hopefully sharp this time, and we have so many exciting sessions for you. So looking forward to seeing you all then, and have a wonderful afternoon. Bye until tomorrow. <laughs>